Alex Frank, it is so nice to have you on Pints with Aquinas. Uh, nice to meet you, Matt. Now you Glad reached, to be here. Thank you. You reached out to me because of the wonderful Dominicans in the East Province here in the States. They, How did that happen? Did they just... They really helped to bring me to the faith. Okay. Um, I just graduated from Yale at the time, and I was converted to Catholicism. Now I'm studying with them. Wow. Awesome. So for those who aren't aware of you, and I'm sure that's most people, since I don't think you have a big online presence, do you? No. Give it just sort of sum up your story before before we dive into it. I grew up in Washington, D.C., where I searched through almost everything that secular society has to offer, all the different personal growth systems, all the different uh, truths. The main one was Kashmiri Shaivism, a sophisticated type of yoga, which I went really in depth into. That brought some good things, but also some bad things, a lot of bad things. All these smaller truths led me finally to Catholicism. I was especially inspired by the glory of Christ in sacrificing himself to raise all of us up to more truth and love. Mm. When were you baptized? I was baptized two and a half years ago it's at horrific. the Dominican House of Studies. Wow. And what about your family? Were they Christian? You weren't baptized? No. My family and my upbringing in general were very anti-Christian. Oh, wow. I had a, a lot of bad <clears throat> stereotypes about the church. I'm, I, I was saying to you before this show, like, I'm so pumped to chat with you. Like, sometimes I'll have someone on the show and I, I know basically their story, but I have to ask them questions to bring it out for the audience. But I'm just super pumped to kind of get to know you and, and learn about your story for myself. I hope <laughs> that sharing it can do some good service to the church. Indeed. Yeah. Well, why don't we start with, with your upbringing, if you don't mind talking about why your parents were anti-Christian and how yeah. that influenced your view of Christianity. Certainly. I was raised ostensibly Jewish, hmm. but really scientific materialist. I went to Hebrew school a little bit. I was bar mitzvahed, but the, the Jewish faith wasn't really a part of our lives. Uh, my family really just dismissed it because they thought it contradicted with science. They thought it was a lot of superstition. They thought that religion was very bigoted. They didn't appreciate the spiritual side of life because they were very uh, focused on scientific materialism. And then likewise with all the people around me. I was growing up in the Washington, D.C. elite and things are very focused on politics and worldly things there. I had to leave D.C. just to figure out how to have a normal conversation that didn't involve politics. Mm. So they were very anti-religion, but at the same time, I did have some intuition that there was more there. Uh, I was studying physics a lot. I got a bachelor's degree in physics. I was attracted by the rigor of it, especially because there were so many confusing perspectives in DC that didn't really seem to have much rigor. So I, I ran to physics, especially to, to gain that sense of rigor. Well, your folks, they sound, I mean, if they're talking about scientific materialism, is that the kind of language that they would use? It, it no. Will, oh, okay. I wasn't sure. Are they kind of sort of uh, intellectuals, your, your folks in that sense? or uh, They are intellectuals, but mostly focused on politics. Oh, I see. And so this, this sort of, this, uh, this, this, scientific materialism is really just something they've sort of imbibed and shared with you, maybe not explicitly, but okay. Exactly. And that's one of the things I realized is that's actually a very prominent worldview. And a lot of people just go through life with those assumptions, even yeah. if they're not conscious of it yeah. or explicit. Yeah, that's a great point. So you started studying physics. What was your, what was your like opinion of Christians at this point? Was your opinion of Christians the same as it was for other religions like Judaism and Islam, or did you have a particular animus for Christianity? I had a particular animus for Christianity at this uh, point. Yeah. Okay, so how would have you explained that in college? Well, I bought into all the stereotypes that are common in secular society about Christianity, that it causes wars, that it's very anti-science, that it's a lot of superstition. And I was very suspicious of Christianity's attempts to gain influence in politics because I thought that we only needed to follow secular things and mm -hmm. scientific things or secular philosophies in the public sphere. Now, at my school, I was it was a pretty liberal school, so I was raised with even a more positive view of Islam mm. than Christianity. And Christianity had all these bad stereotypes associated with it. 
but uh, Islam was highly regarded and then also tribal animistic religions too were talked about in a good way. We actually did some Native American rituals. I didn't realize at the, the time they were rituals and things like that, but now I can look back and say, oh, okay, those were actual animistic things. Judaism ha held a higher status just because the Jews were you know, victimized in, in the past by um, some very bad secular philosophies. Mm, okay. So you started studying physics? Started studying physics. And that was very good because it, it held a lot of rigor, but it, it couldn't tell me where my dog would be three seconds from now. What does that mean? So the, the laws of physics are very elegant. They have a lot of explanatory power. Yeah. They can explain so many things and they've led to all sorts of great technology and, and many other things. But when it comes to other sides of life, they just fail completely at explaining things, even where my dog will be three seconds from now. Is this a common phrase? I haven't heard anybody say that. So there is there is someone that I got that phrase from. It's a Zen Buddhist philosopher named Ken Wilber. And hmm. he was one of the first ones that started to open me up to the spiritual side of things. And he guided me along a lot of the path. He looked beyond a lot of the bad parts of uh, dominant secular philosophies, but then there were some problems later on that led me to Catholicism. Okay, so you were dissatisfied with scientific materialism, studying physics, and would you say there was this sort of desire in you to for there to be more in life and to, to see if there was a spiritual element? How, how did you start going down that path? Definitely. Um, first, I could see that I was, I really admired just the sense of purpose and the sense of depth in a lot of the, the Jewish people that took the Torah seriously mm -hmm. and would spend a long time just meditating on this. It really struck me that this was something significant and important that shaped them in a good way. At the same time, I was suspicious of that because it seemed like it, it would inconvenience my personal life to have to buy into especially the ethics around it, whereas secular society just kind of lets you do with you what you want with hedonism and playing lots of video games and things like that. Yeah. Okay. And so at that point, if you had have embraced Judaism and not in the sort of Larry David bagel curb your enthusiasm sense, but in the, like in the actual religious weight of Judaism, how would your parents have responded to that? Do you think? They would have found it a little strange, but they would not have been very threatened by it mm. as they, they would have been with Christianity they would have thought I was going off a little weird, but Judaism is something they're more familiar with and don't have as many biases against. Yeah, I know it's like, I think it's probably a straw man, right, to say, and you're not saying this, but but to say, well, atheists don't want to submit to Christianity because they are aware that there's many things they would have to stop doing and begin doing uh, that would sort of impede their life of hedonism. Uh, that might be true some of the time, maybe a lot of the time, but I think there are good-willed atheists who, who, who are looking for the truth and are really open to changing their lives, should it be true. Uh, that said, I remember as a teenager, I would say things like, I'm spiritual, not religious. And if, if I was to like examine why I said that, it's because I wanted a sort of depth to the universe, uh, a purpose to the universe, but I didn't want to have to do anything that I didn't want to do. Um, so how did you start getting in interested in Eastern religions. Was was that for the same sort of perp, same reason? Spiritual but not religious, as it were? Uh, certainly. They seem to have a lot of technical sophistication and rigor to their practice without having any ethical demands. Hmm. So they didn't seem to have any beliefs or worldview associated with them. They didn't seem to demand that you change your life in any meaningful way. So it was just, oh, here's a technique that will help you enhance your consciousness, your awareness. And then that will make you more spiritual. Yeah. It sort of seems grounded in the scientific scientific truths in a sense. Like here is a technique that when you do, you know, this will follow. It, it, that's part of, I think, what's attractive about it. It's like we want the spirituality, but we don't want to have to adopt the supernatural, as it were. That's a good point. It, it did seem to match the scientific worldview that was very technocratic and technically focused. Mm. Seemingly. So who is Ken Wilber? Because I've heard his name a lot, and you mentioned him. 
He is a philosopher that has founded Integral Philosophy. What he's done is he's looked at many different truth systems, especially a lot of psychology and then a lot of Eastern religions. And he's tried to find some way to, some reference frame to integrate them together. Hmm. He's looked for what he calls orienting generalizations. Okay. Sort of these general principles about each different truth system. And then he's tried to put them into one integral map. Mm. And his map is pretty sophisticated, but it, it's also pretty simple with its elegance at the same time. He does a pretty good job in that he gets away from a lot of the perspectivalism, a lot of this, oh, just whatever I believe is the truth and my truth is my truth of the postmodernists, of uh, a lot of dominant trends in, in secular society. And he, he did open me up to the spiritual side of life. He has, uh, he talks about the great chain of being, the great nest of being. These are the different levels of reality, the, the gross material world, the world of the soul, the subtle world, he calls it, and then the causal world, which is the pure, still ground of being, the wow. eternal, formless awareness. Interesting. That's what he would call it. So was he the first person you encountered that got you down this path? Yes. Okay, so tell us how that happened. How did you first uh, encounter his teachings, and what was that like? I was graduating Duke at the time, hmm. where I got my bachelor's degree in physics. That was good in many respects. My physics education was very good. Learned a lot about history and studied some of the other humanities, but I realized I knew very little about life, actually, once I graduated from school, once I had some time to reflect on all my experiences. Further, I was about to go into the army, at the time, and I was going to be an infantry officer. So I was facing up to leading soldiers in combat, and I didn't really know why I was asking them to risk their lives or how I was going to do it. So I figured that I needed to figure that out. I started asking more of these deep questions. I started looking into philosophy, especially Ken Wilber. And I started to look into all these different secular personal growth systems for an understanding of how to lead and how to understand the problems in Iraq and Afghanistan, all these other things. Other than Ken Wilber, who else were you looking to who you found inspiring at the time? There were a couple other Buddhist teachers that were very inspiring. And then I was also searching through uh, people like Eckhart Tolle. Mm-hmm. Some of the ones that are very common in secular in uh, in those circles, Adyashanti would be another one, and then I was looking through a lot of the uh, the personal growth people like Jack Welch for leadership, and uh, then some developmental psychologists like Robert Keegan from Harvard to understand the stages of development mm. and how to work on yourself to grow into a more complete person. And was this, like how, how did this bless you? How did this help you? We don't tend to engage in things if there's an immediate negative repercussion. So clearly there must have been something in it that you were seeking that you were beginning to find. Oh, yes, uh, that's definitely true. Uh, first, it just explained a lot of the things that I was unsure about. It, it made me realize that not everything can be explained by science. And I was frustrated because even though I had studied a lot of physics and I knew a lot of people with uh, more advanced studies in physics and would, would talk with them about these things, I, I could see the limitations of science, whereas this just helped to set the proper boundaries of it. Mm. That then helped me to understand the important parts of the human world much more. That especially comes to things like how certain military units can be better than others. Mm. There just aren't material explanations for how certain military units can be better than others. There are- In what sense do you mean better? So more effective, more combat effective huh. than others. Units can have way more equipment and better equipment and more people, but they can just be much worse. Interesting. Than units with many, much less people, less equipment. And passion. Yes, passion has a lot to do with it. The, the spirit of a military unit really matters a lot. Its sense of cohesion and its sense of purposefulness. Mm. 
I was, these personal growth philosophies at least helped me to wrap my mind around these things and start thinking about them in a more complete way. Yeah, okay. It also helped with uh, the world of women. I was a pretty nerdy guy growing up at first. Uh, I was into physics and in my high school, the, uh, I wasn't very popular in those areas, but uh, they helped me to show, they helped show me the importance of the emotional world of passion and of bringing these types of things more to the forefront in a way that can create more uh, human connection and lead to meaningful relationships in a very vague sense of the word. I, mean, mm. they'd, I realized later on that meaningful is a difficult term for them. Mm. Okay, very cool. Um, so you're going through all this stuff. Is this before you were in Afghanistan? I presume you ended up going there. This is before I was in Afghanistan. Okay. Yeah. I, I should tell you that, uh, so a lot of, the, you asked for some of the people that I was uh, interested in. So I searched through a lot of, for example, the relationship and dating coaches in secular society. Yeah. And one of the some of the first people I stumbled upon, for example, was the pickup artist. But luckily I had enough sense even at that time, thanks to some of the vestiges of my Jewish upbringing to recognize that they're just shamelessly manipulating people. So that was a big wake up call for me. Then I went to some of the other dating coaches that at least were sort of better at masking their egotism. Mm. Uh, they were they were pursuing what they thought were meaningful relationships and they at least did get me outside of my shell mm. and able to sort of relate in a more authentic way in a good way you know when you say you were studying physics and maybe there was this desire for there to be more um what can you and you i i see that you're pointing to there's got to be something more than just good artillery well organized and things like this but was there some were you were you reading the athe the new atheists at the time were you not sort of convinced by them because presumably they would all have responses to maybe some of the doubts you had about a materialist world. I wasn't reading New Atheist philosophy at the time, but the general perspectives in American military history made that very clear to me. I was studying a lot of okay. military history. Yeah. And they talked a lot about the material side of war. That's very important, the logistics especially. And the United States has been great, always awesome at the material side of war. Hmm. I mean, in Vietnam, we managed to <laughs> sustain a million soldiers in that one small country, you know, halfway across the world. Afghanistan was an even harder logistical problem because it's a landlocked country and Pakistan is ostensibly our ally, but not the best. And then we had Russian allied countries on the top. So it was very hard to sustain ourselves logistically there. Speaking of water, we even flew in enough bottled water to sustain all the American soldiers there. Hmm. We were drinking bottled water in the middle of this landlocked country hmm. that was imported all the way from, I think, India or some, some other place. Hmm. So logistically, we accomplish a lot in the United States, in the American way of war. But there it became clear to me through those studies that that was insufficient i mean i would read the people that would argue more for the materialistic side of war but the their explanations were just not complete for issues like uh, afghanistan and iraq okay all right so you're looking into these different coaches you're looking into these different sort of uh, uh what would you call them buddhist uh, teachers yes how how did that begin influencing your life um maybe ritualistically? Did you start to engage in meditation and things like this? And how did that process to your interest in yoga? At that point, it didn't change my life too much uh, because I didn't really appreciate the importance of aligning habits and, and rituals to the, these mm -hmm. types of values. And the, the philosophy was very abstract and was just very focused on these are sort of big high-flying principles. And these are sort of vague notions of how to cultivate more awareness. So it, they didn't really emphasize the importance initially of changing my life and of doing those kinds of things. What it did do though, is it did sort of change my thinking. So I started to pontificate <laughs> nice. a good amount on these issues. 
to who and how did that go? <laughs> St. Augustine talks about this, how there were just a lot of uh, sophists basically pontificating about different partial truths that they were very confident in. And they just had this vague notion of like sharing the truth and engaging in free flowing conversation. I mean, there's a lot of good that can come from free flowing conversation, of course, but a lot of that was just uh, pontificating on, on sort of your basic understanding of things as if you really knew what was going on. Um, that was in a lot of random conversations with uh, people while I was traveling in Europe. And it was also with people in the military and the, the did they can did they consider you preachy so some of them did but at the time i i still had some sense of humility again i think from my jewish upbringing a, a little bit uh -huh. of it yeah uh so that helped a little bit okay uh, some of them were more intrigued because i i was talking about things that were common in the secular media so it didn't come across as me preaching to them. Yeah. You know, these types of personal growth systems don't really present themselves as philosophies mm. or theologies. So I came to realize later on, though, that it's more of a marketing ploy. Mm. I mean, I, I really was kind of preaching to them, mm. even though I myself wasn't aware of that uh, at the time. But it there really was a, a big change in mentality that I was undergoing myself and that I was preaching to them. Mm. So eventually I started to see the importance of worldviews, especially guided by Ken Wilber. He talks a lot about the importance of them. And how did you get introduced to yoga? So I, I went through my military time, was deployed to Afghanistan, and then got back from Afghanistan, was in garrison in Germany for two years where we were just doing a normal garrison life, which is a pretty normal job, physical fitness in the morning, administrative work, training. Throughout all of this, I, I started to have back problems, things like that. And yoga seemed to provide a good solution to that. It seemed something that, was, that would heal my body, but at the same time, it, I, like you were saying, that there's this attraction with more depth mm. to something, I could, feel that in, in yoga, even though I wasn't willing to admit it at the time because I just thought I was getting into it for health issues. Looking back, I can say that there was also this attraction to sort of something more, something happening in the universe. Yeah. So I started practicing just the very common Hatha yoga. And how are you doing this in Germany? Were there yoga teachers? Are you doing this online? I started to do it in earnest when I got back to the United States. I see. Just in a normal yoga studio. Okay. And then it was when I got out of the army that I started to go in much more depth with it. Okay. Well, tell, tell us about your immediate experience with yoga and how you got deep into it. So the postures were certainly helpful in bringing more alignment to my body. Um, I was very stiff at that time. I'd been through ranger school and mm. a lot of other military training, a year in Afghanistan, patrolling in the desert. And then uh, military physical fitness as well was a big wear and tear. It helped with all those things. And it also started to, again, bring sort of more emotional awareness and emotional discipline, as they would call it. They talk a lot about improving your feeling tone. Hmm. That's a lot of the goal of yoga. Yoga teachers say that the whole purpose of the asanas is to improve your feeling tone. Now, the whole purpose of the what? Of the yoga postures. The postures, I see. The physical postures yeah. are called asanas. Okay, thanks. It is to improve your feeling tone. I, I was only practicing the superficial common yoga yeah. that's out there in the West. And I mean, it, it was also nice because it seemed like a good way to meet women since there, there were far more of them in the, the class than men. Yeah. Uh, but I also realized that yoga was, I had started to study a lot of psychology at that time. Like Carl Jung, mm -hmm. for example. The postures seem to have some kind of symbolic aspect to them. Right. They had a symbolic meaning. They, uh, one of them is called warrior pose, for example. Yeah, I know what it is. Yeah. Virabhadra. 
This is where you wrap one leg around the other and put your hands together. Is this the one? No. Okay. Uh, warrior pose is like a lunge. Oh, I know what it is. Yeah. There's yeah, we would do that like in, you know, we wouldn't call it that necessarily, but like in CrossFit, right? Before you, it's kind of a like stretch before you work out. Yes. It's certainly possible just to lunge and not have that be yoga. In fact, a lot of these postures were taken from uh, Western gymnastics by Christian Murthy. Huh. back 100 years ago gosh where do we go from here because i i, I, I want to know like i want to ask you so many questions all at once i want to ask you about the origins of yoga i want to ask you like what if some person just wants to stretch their back out and they go and see gladys the pseudo yoga teacher at the gym and how is that even bad and i have so where do you want to where do you want to begin with this should we begin with the sort of origins of yoga that maybe a lot of us don't know of or sure the origins would be good, or I can just sort of tell chronologically how I came to it. Sure, let's do that. Okay. Uh, it wasn't until later on that I came to realize the origins of yoga, because they're not very upfront with what they are. I have no idea what they are. Like, I know it comes from Hinduism, but that's all I know. Or maybe I don't even know that, so, okay. Yeah. Um, that took me a while to realize. I mean, I started to see that the postures had some kind of symbolic value to them. I was becoming more emotionally aware. So I started to feel that they did actually change my emotions in a way. Huh. In a way that I wasn't conscious of at first. Like, there were some real changes happening in my soul from doing the practice. Most of them were initially positive. I mean, I could feel that my emotions were becoming sort of more disciplined, more aligned, more alive. But then I started to notice some weird and quirky ones at first too. So for example, I, I started to sense that it was just weird boundaries being in a room full of people wearing skimpy clothes and bending our bodies into weird postures it's even worse with things like uh bikram yoga you'll, ha you'll have to explain these terms to me and my audience i'm not sure what that means so bikram yoga is a form of yoga founded by mr bikram and they actually get in a really hot room together strip to their underwear and then do the same sequence of poses over and over again mm. I only did that twice. Is this hot yoga? Is that what is that the same thing or similar? Hot yoga is a general term. Okay. For uh, those types of yoga. And then within, hatha yoga is the main one that's practiced in the West. That's the most common form. Within hatha yoga, there's a lot of different sects that are affiliated with different teachers. They're usually named after the teacher. Mm. For example, forest yoga was founded by, I think her name is Anna Forrest. And as different teachers grow through the ranks, then they become more prominent and found their own style of Hatha Yoga that emphasizes different parts. They all have a certain commonality to them, but then they they change based on the style of the teacher. It sounds like martial arts in a way. You know, different martial arts schools kind of evolve as somebody rises in the ranks and that school is then named after them. Yeah, that's a good analogy. There's certainly a lot of... Uh, different masters and they're always competing for disciples with different people and, and forming their own cliques mm -hmm. of disciples. Okay. Uh, when I got out of the army, I started to go much more in depth into this stuff. I spent three months in a Zen monastery. You gotta tell us about that. <laughs> that was in upstate New York. <laughs> okay. In the Catskill Mountains. How does one spend three months in a Zen monastery? Like do they have a website? Like, how did you find them? How did you contact them? I've been doing a lot more reading. So when I was in the army, I was mostly just focused on that. I was learning about counterinsurgency. I was doing it in Afghanistan. I was focusing on becoming a better officer. I was learning about all the different difficulties we were having with Iraq and Afghanistan. That was my focus and mission at the time. But then I started to move more towards the spiritual side. Uh, because of the seeds that had been planted earlier that I was talking about. Mm -hmm. I started to read, especially a biography of a Zen master, Junpo Dennis Kelly Roshi, who was actually a, uh, I think it was the third largest LSD dealer in California during the 1970s until he got busted by the FBI. He was also a Zen master. <laughs> he thought that drugs could help bring people to more awareness. Mm -hmm. And this is a common trend in in eastern religions but at the time it, it didn't seem like much of a problem to me unfortunately mm -hmm. so i uh i read about this monastery in his biography 
And then, yes, they, they do have a website. <laughs> okay. You can just go to the website and email them and say, I'm interested in spending more time in your monastery. And I had only done some meditation practice on my own at the time, actually. I mean, with some formal teaching, but not much from what I would say now. I mean, in, in hindsight, that was really weird to me because these were messing with sort of the, the very depths of our mind. You want to do that in a well thought out way. You what? don't just want to kind of throw practices out there and things like that. Okay. All right. So they said, yeah, come and spend three months. How does that work? Do you offer a donation? Do you pay? I'm super interested. I don't want to go. I'm just interested. <laughs> well, the, there were a lot of interesting <clears throat> things about it. I mean, it was very Japanese. Uh, they did charge yeah. uh, a certain amount of money yeah, for spending some time there. And how many people were part of this? They were... Not those who ran it necessarily, but those who I'm asking, like, who who's showing up there? Are there like hundreds of people there for for sort of meditation practices or... It would swell up to about 50 to 100 people during the retreats, which huh. were one week a month. Yeah. That was really intense practice time. The other three weeks of the month were just normal practice time where we would meditate about three hours a day. Wow. We kept a pretty strict monastic aerarium. There were services every morning. I was really shocked to even find services because I just thought that it was about, you know, techniques to improve your consciousness and, and things like that. But no, they gather, they chant some of the Buddhist sutras, and then they they have a sort of drum beat that uh -huh. they go to. And they they did a chant, a really intense chant, every morning to Kanzeon, the Bodhisattva of Compassion, also called Aviloka Teshvara. You have to explain that to me, I'm sorry. The bodhisattvas are sort of like the Buddhist saints. Okay. Um, and Avalokiteshvara is the most important of the Buddhist saints. Interesting. In a lot of strands of Buddhism, it's a she. In some of the earlier ones, it's a he, actually. And she was one of the Buddha's closest associates. Okay. Uh, closest disciples. And so she's... In Mahayana Buddhism, the, the second major trend in Buddhism after the first one, she is considered to be uh, one of the main figures there. So how how so in this service, what are you doing? I, 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 like so like in a Catholic service, one might pray to a saint, asking them to pray to God. What are you doing with these figures who are associates of the Buddha? Are you offering sacrifices? Are you talking to them? What's the? You're mostly doing ritual chants. Uh, and for what end? That was a good question. I actually didn't really know what end we were doing them to. I didn't understand it at that point. Did you just think we're honoring them or something? I just thought that it was some exercise to do to improve awareness. Okay. And I thought that these, I thought of these people maybe as role models. If they were good meditators yeah. and we were supposed to try and imitate them and get their aid. Mm. Maybe in some vague way that I didn't really understand in sure. becoming better meditators. All right, just real quick before you go on, because I'm super interested in like what a day in the life of a at a Buddhist monastery looks like. So you wake up at what time? Oh, during the retreat periods, we woke up at four thirty. Okay, every day, and then I think during the normal periods, it was six. Okay, and do you you say you have three hours of meditation a day? So what is just real quickly? What does a day in the life look? A typical day. It wasn't so different than what you'd find in a Benedictine monastery. I see. There's a lot of work and mm -hmm. meditation. Cool. What kind of work did you do? I would do a lot of cleaning. They do this <laughs> Japanese ritual, for example, called zokinin, which is where instead of a mop, you take just a rag, dip it in a bucket, and then you do a sort of downward dog, okay. a, a bend on the floor, and you run across the floor. Huh. To clean off the floor, holding the rag. See, on that the floor. that sounds like a cool way to do cleaning in a Zen monastery. It, it would suck <laughs> if you showed up for three months and they're like, "Here are the toilets." <laughs> well, the, the the toilets were immaculate, and and I did clean some okay. of them too. It was it was a lot of. Did you at least do it in a cool thing. way, like make a cool hand gesture and run around the bowl? No, okay. Well, all of these things were supposed to be ways of cultivating more awareness. You, you were supposed to do them with a lot of care. That's neat. Yeah. Okay, cool. And, okay, so, and when were the three hours of meditation? Were they all at once in the morning or were they 
No. Um, first, I think we did, if I remember correctly, we did just one hour in the morning of meditation, then about one hour of a service. Um, then we did a half hour right before lunch after the morning work period. Then we would have a brief break. Then we'd do yoga in the afternoon. Then a little bit more work. Then more. Then we go to dinner, and then we'd have about another hour and a half of meditation after dinner. Okay, cool. Thank you for sharing that with me. All right, so you so you you're going to these services. You're not terribly sure why we're maybe invoking someone, but right, still thinking about higher awareness. All right, so what happened over the course of these three months? How did your opinion change one way or the other? So I I started to certainly sense that the spiritual side mattered more. It did start to open me up, and I was inspired to pursue some of these things more as well. There were lots of stories about just very rigorous Zen masters who endured all sorts of difficulties in order to rise to higher states of awareness and things like that. I was pretty inspired by those stories. Yeah. I, I thought that they were really interesting, the, the ascetical mortifications that they would do. At the same time, I, I thought that Zen was a little weird in, in two things. First, they were trying really hard to be Japanese, it seemed to me. They had uh, they did a lot of the chants in Japanese, and uh, they they had a lot of Japanese customs. They had a lot of Japanese art, which seemed to depict spiritual things like maras, which are their version of spirits. And a lot of them, frankly, looked pretty demonic. So I started to think that maybe there was more to it than that. That there was really a, a sense of a deity. A lot of this was from Japanese Shintoism, Shintoism, mind you. But those things just heavily influenced the Zen religion because they were in a, a Shinto culture. Also, I even though I, I admired the rigor of it, and I did start to, to sense that it, it gave me more sort of self-mastery <laughs> over my mind, the, there were problems within what to do with these experiences that I was becoming more conscious of. It started to turn me on to one of the major problems with just focusing on awareness. Consciousness is a just vague, amorphous term. That's the center of the religion. That's what everyone talked about. But I never really understood what it was during these first few times that I was these first few serious uh, endeavors into it. So. It was usually presented without much explanation and then with a lot of, sort of vague, mysterious hand waves of, oh, this is consciousness. It's, it's great. Cultivate more of it. And it was usually said in a very mysterious, low voice that was kind of weird. So I, I started to try and, and figure that out, but I realized that I was becoming more conscious of a lot of, a lot of feelings and difficulties. You know, I'd just gotten out of the army, so I was adjusting to life in the civilian world. But that consciousness didn't really tell me what to do with all of these uh, different feelings and, and emotions and, and things like that that were coming up and, and different life difficulties and trials. One of, the things that's, one of the things you pointed out earlier is that as you were engaging in yoga, you noticed some positive things happening, but you also said some quirky. What does that mean? I think you used the word quirky. Yeah. Or strange. There certainly were some quirky things in it was things like the uh, Mara statues in the I Japanese see. monastery. And I, I also just felt weird movements in my soul that I didn't know exactly what they, they were talking about, what, what was going on. What does that mean, weird movements in your soul? Uh, weird, weird feelings and uh, weird, nothing that was that off the wall. I mean, I, I was able to keep myself really grounded largely thanks to, I think, some of my physics training and, and just my general common sense that I, I gleaned from the military. But um, they certainly, uh, they're certainly trying to open you up to a lot of things. They say just to open and there was constant talk of opening your heart and opening to different feelings, especially in the yoga world, not as much in the Zen. But some of those things, I just didn't understand what they were. 
and uh, how to, why I was opening myself up to these things. Mm. Uh, is Zen Buddhism always associated with yoga? I, I, I wasn't aware of this. So at the monastery, you're saying you're, you're, you're going through yoga every day. Yeah. Is that, is that common in Buddhism? Buddhism originally comes from yoga. The oh, Buddha was wow. originally a yogi. What? Yeah. Back in about 2500 BC. Right. The Buddha went off and spent a lot of time with some extreme ascetical yogis. This is blowing my mind. Like I knew the Buddha, if we can call him that, was from India. And, and he yep. was a Hindu at the time. Is that mm -hmm. correct or no? He was a Hindu. Right. And he was a very well-to-do one. He yeah. uh, was in a palace, uh, if I remember correctly. He had a, a marriage to a very prominent yeah. and beautiful princess. I looked princess. into it a little bit myself. It, there was like a similarity to, to, to St. Francis in a sense, that he encountered poverty and then kind of for, for, got rid of his wealth. And Well, you could tell the story better than me. I'm sorry. No, they, they, that's absolutely accurate. And, and that is uh, to his credit in, in some respect. And he was really willing to sacrifice his worldly position to try and seek some kind of truth. And then he went really in depth into some of these extreme yoga and ascetical traditions, but was turned off by them. And so he veered more towards the middle path, which isn't so extreme in its asceticism as the, the yogic path that he was doing. And uh, he developed a few different doctrines. So one of the main ones, for example, is that Buddhism doesn't believe in the, in the soul, actually. So it doesn't believe that you have an individual identity. It has the doctrine of non-self versus yoga believes in a soul. Buddhism says that you are supposed to just realize your own impersonal awareness, which is what you really are, which is the formless ground of all eternity, the divine emptiness. You're supposed to completely empty yourself of yourself. Whereas yoga, you're supposed to grow yourself, empower yourself, and then m realize that yourself is actually the divine. Okay, so how does this, how do they reconcile this in a Zen Buddhist monastery where they're practicing yoga? Or does it depend on the monastery? That's a good question, and there's been a lot of different changes and evolution on this over the centuries, and even in recent times. We were practicing yoga in the monastery, mostly because of this guy, Jumpo Dennis Kelly Roshi. He realized that the Zen Buddhist... Super cool name, by the way. If you're going to be a yogi <laughs> or a whatever, that's a great name. Matt Frad, not a good yogi teacher name. No, yeah. Like that lady you were saying last name was Forrest. Forrest Yoga. That sounds good. It's got a good ring to it. Fred They're, Yoga, they would never take off. They are very clever, uh, very clever marketers, yes. Uh, I don't think Alex Frank Yoga would take <laughs> off on me. It sounds too frank. It, nice. Uh, Real quick, I mean, I, I don't mean to oversimplify this, and, 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 and the last thing I want to do is sort of make a straw man of things I don't even understand. So please feel free to push back on me. But it sounds like just generally what you're saying is, the belief in, in, in Buddhism is there is no self, and the belief in yoga is your self is God. So yes. your two options are you're either nothing or God. Yes. Yeah. Is that? that? That's accurate. Okay. I mean, ultimately, they lead towards roughly the same spot, which is the <clears throat> Buddhists will say things like your true self is the divine, especially some of the more modern Buddhists. But it, it's two different paths. There's one of sort of denying the, the ego, Buddhism, the ego is the real enemy. And then there's one of sort of trans... Actually, it might be a little difficult to say that. There's another of building up, of sort of developing more of an identity, but then realizing that identity is the divine, huh. is God. D does one lead itself to hedonism in a way that the other doesn't? Um, that's a good question. I think that yoga does lead more towards hedonism than Buddhism necessarily, because Buddhism just doesn't deal with those types of things. It doesn't deal with the world of emotions as much. And that's sort of what led me actually more towards yoga from Buddhism. After I got out of this uh, Zen monastery, then I actually went to do the yoga teacher training and spent some time in the Amazon rainforest. Gosh, that sounds so cool. I know I shouldn't find it cool, but like doing yoga in a Amazon rainforest or that sounds yeah cool
oh, there, there's a lot of romantic appeal. Yeah, that's what it is. Yeah, so yeah. I got kind of swept up into that a little bit myself. I mean, the, the military was some romanticism on my part. I yeah. wanted to go off and do great things for my country. And a lot of it was pretty good, but uh, it's important to then get grounded. Yeah. What did, what did your folks think about you going to a Zen Buddhist monastery for three months? So they were fine with it as long as it didn't thwart my worldly success. Uh -huh. Similar to what was going on with St. Augustine, where they weren't so concerned with my spiritual well-being. Because you, you went to Yale, to law school at Yale, is that right? The, this, I went to Yale after all of these experiences. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I had just, uh, actually, when I was in the car to go to the Zen monastery was when I found out that I got into Yale. Hmm. So that's when I, I knew that that's where I was going. Afterwards. All right, so you get out of this Buddhist monastery and you want to take the, the kind of yoga path more than the Buddhist path. Yes. Now, help me, is a yogi a, a yoga teacher? Is that what a yogi is? What is a yogi? A yoga practitioner. Oh, okay. One who practices yoga. What mm -hmm. is a yoga teacher called? That's a good question. There's a 400-hour <laughs> certification. Holy. For Holy, a wow. yoga teacher. And, um, so uh, you're blowing my mind here. I, I had no idea that Buddha was a, was he a yoga teacher or a yogi, a yogi? Uh, he founded basically different people would say different things about exactly how this went. Yeah. He's definitely started off as a yogi. Okay. He learned a lot of his <clears throat> important ideas from yoga. Okay. And then he went off and founded his own sect that became more Buddhism rather than yoga. See, this is fascinating. Like, I think my ignorance is probably illustrative of most Americans' ignorance when it comes to yoga. Like, yoga just sounds like it's kind of like a newer thing. And you're like, no, it like predated Christ. Yes. <laughs> it, it predated Christ. Um, but at the same time, there were some interesting parallels in the development with it. You know, you had in the Jewish tradition, you had the, the Mosaic law that came down, <clears throat> which was similar to the Hindu Brahminic, very loose analogy to mm -hmm. the, the Hindu Brahminic. And then you had a more um, mystical, ascetical strand grow in it. And that was similar with how the prophet Elijah started the, the mystical, ascetical stand, strand mm -hmm. in, in Judaism which then went to the Carmelites, for example, mm. in Christianity, in Catholicism. So when you say you went to be a yoga and teacher, um, you did that in the Amazon rainforest? You couldn't just do that in D.C. somewhere? You had to go... uh, that was actually in the rainforest of Costa Rica. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so that's where you went to become a yoga teacher? At a very posh place, yes. Really? Blue spirit. Wow. Wow. Tell us, tell us about that. <laughs> Everyone was walking around in leggings, but the, the food was very good. The resort was very nice. It was very luxurious. Wow. Was uh, it place. expensive? Yes, it, it was pretty expensive. Yeah. And uh, that's sort of what I was alluding to earlier. And <clears throat> this stuff has become very commercialized. And one of my teachers charged, uh, this was after I, I was one of his students, but he charges $1,000 for two and a half hours of his time. Hmm. And mindfulness has become a $1.1 billion industry, according to IBS World. And some people call it McMindfulness. Hmm. So there's a lot of money in it. And um, Lululemon pants are, are very expensive. I the what? Lululemon. Oh, yeah, I've heard the, of that. The main brand with the Omega symbol. Okay. Uh, they're very expensive. I think they run $150 for yeah, workout tr pants. Trust America to just take something and run, run it into the ground and make as much money as we can from it. <laughs> yeah, so these things do tend to get commercialized and, okay. and they're good at making it seem like it's a new cool thing. Yeah. That is not that big of a deal. They, they want to make it seem like it, it's not too threatening. It doesn't involve many changes to your life. You can just sort of use it as a way to enhance yourself as a person mm. or to, to grow as a person. Coming from a Zen Buddhist monastery, were you turned off by the uh, the commercialization of it at, at this resort? Um, I did have some common sense then, largely thanks to the military and some of my Jewish upbringing. So I, I was suspicious of it, but what I didn't have at the time was the moral integrity to then actually put my foot down and say, no, I'm going to do something different. Mm. I didn't have the sense of, okay, well, if I actually think this way, if... I'm a little put off by the commercial of it, commercial, uh, 
commercial aspect of it, then I should do something else maybe. Even okay. maybe found my own yoga sector, found find a teacher that wasn't so commercial. Yeah. In it. What, what's the general thought uh, and attitude towards sexuality? I, I assume there may not be any specific teachings, but as you're at this place in Costa Rica, yes. Um, what, what's the general consensus or view of, of human sexuality? That's a good question. So you have to disentangle first some of the traditional views that come from the, the tradition that's heavily influenced by the, the cultures from where these places come. The Hindu caste system was very influential on the development of yoga. And in places like Japan, they had Japanese Shintoism, they had Confucianism in China. Mm -hmm. So those views on sexuality influence a lot of the tradition. But then in the West, it's gotten heavily hijacked by the new left, by the countercultural revolution in the 1960s and 70s. It was those kinds of people who were bringing it into the West, and so they have brought a lot of their own decadence. Uh, decadence to <laughs> yeah. it. Oh, yeah. I mean, the extreme version of it is modern neo-tantra, which has devolved into a lot of crazed sex parties. I mean, I, I, I met people that were involved in that, and I kind of knew what was going on, but again, thanks to my Jewish upbringing, I still had some sense of boundaries, luckily. Mm. Um, but I, I know a lot of people who fell into that stuff. And along with sexuality, there was also a, a big interest in drugs, mm. like I was alluding to. There was that Zen master who was the, the LSD dealer. And then at the Zen monastery I went to, there was a good amount of drugs and there was a good amount of sexual hedonism. Not too much, but uh, a good amount of it. I'm just kind of wondering, like as somebody who hasn't hung out with a bunch of yoga teachers, I'm wondering if I like, sat down as a fellow yoga teacher and just had the thought that human beings are sacred and we shouldn't treat people as means to ends and that we should perhaps save that powerful gift of sexuality to someone that we want to be with forever. Like that kind of language, how would that go over with, with these folks, do you think? I know we're just sort of speculating. Well, I did ask these questions. So you're absolutely right in that the initial teachings would say something like, oh, just follow your desires, but in a respectful way. <laughs> That's the kind of crap I was told as a teenager. That didn't work yeah. at all. <laughs> it's like telling someone, you just got to be happy, you know, just do what makes you happy. You're like, respect people. It's like so vague, so generic. A lot of it was to just improve your feeling tone. And they had a lot of psychological language about reducing sexual tension. Okay. A lot of it, I realized later, was very Freudian in its understanding because Freud was very influential in the New Left countercultural revolution. So a lot of it was just about being in tune with your desires and kind of going along with these things. And just the context that they put you in breeds that kind of loose sense of boundaries as yeah, well. Like it does. Yeah. Saying, you're in bending modesty. your body and into weird positions with people. Yeah. So this three week experience in this rainforest in Costa Rica, was it cool? Was it, was it, did you, did you begin to sense perhaps the demonic? Um, yes, I did sense it a little bit there. Uh, there were Shipibo there who are master ayahuascaras. They're a tribe of people who have the best reputation for this kind of stuff. And I didn't directly see it myself, but I talked to a lot of people there about it. And about what? The demonic. Okay. There was a lot of bad stuff going on. So for example, there were two other young men on this retreat with me. One of them then later overdosed on opioids and is dead now. I'm sorry. Another, another one actually became a, a neo-Nazi communist huh. after his experience with this. I got to have him on the show. <laughs> <He'd> be, <laughs> from, from yogi to neo-Nazi communist. Uh, he'd be telling you all sorts of weird <laughs> things about what the Zionists have supposedly done. Ah, okay. Well, uh, let's not have him on the show. Yeah. He thinks that the Holocaust was actually a Jewish conspiracy to ah. eliminate the part of the Jews that don't go along. Y'all did that really well, that conspiracy then. <laughs> Masterfully. But this is one of the things that it leads to because you start to really lose your grip on reality, especially okay. the people who are bringing drugs yep. into it. There, there are a good amount of teachers that don't do drugs, and there are a good amount of teachers that don't indulge in the sexual hedonism. 
but they're not willing to really denounce it or talk about the reasons why it could lead to bad things. The spiritual director that I ended up hiring two years down the line from then did talk about the, the important sides of sexuality. And in, he, in what sense? So he started to make me realize that in order to really have a deep love to build something lasting, you needed to commit to one other person. Cool. The masculine desire is for multiplicity is what they would say. Okay. And I think there's something to it. There is some natural masculine desire in us to like have different mm -hmm. flavors that we can sort of taste. And that's the language that they would use. And I don't think that's good language. Anymore. Sure. But that's what they would use. Yeah. That's what they would say. <clears throat> Whereas it's a good mortification and a good practice for us to get over that selfish desire to commit to one. And that at the end of the day is what really will nourish us. That is what will lead towards deeper consciousness and awareness because you can really, by committing to one woman, she will then have the trust to be able to actually really open up to you and give herself to you. Mm, there's truth in that. Whereas a lot of the stuff that was happening before was just men can use their superior consciousness, can use these techniques to basically force their souls into a state of attentiveness and care. And so they give the woman a lot of attention. And they're very attentive with her in a way that makes her feel good. And then they have a nice little fling or something like that in their mind. But then that's taken away. They just go their separate ways because they don't have a sense of committing to anything deeper. And the, the women sort of knew what was going on. I mean, they were kind of into this out of a sense, mostly a feminine empowerment, I think. Mm -hmm. it, it was very, that devolved into a lot of hedonism at the end of the day. And it was really bad. I realized that these things were... First, they're just distracting from the higher things that I was talking about before of committing to one, of really doing the, the hard thing that could lead to something greater, something better. We, sh we need to, that's not something easy to do. So we really need to order our lives towards that. We need to have things like marriage and, mm. and the, the sacraments are such a great gift in helping us rise to that difficulty. The second thing that they do is they really start to just um, fracture us because we're being very attentive to this one person and then them leaving us and then mm -hmm. being very attentive to this other person leaving us. <clears throat> they would say that you need to practice severance, which is how you cut yourself off energetically from these other people, but that never works. Mm, no. Um, as one Dominican friar said, you can only offer yourself so many times to another person mm, before it mm, starts mm, to have significant mm. effects on the soul. But luckily, Christ's grace is very healing. Was your view of Christianity evolving or devolving during this time? <laughs> or were you not really aware of it? Or were you trying to do the Ken Wilber thing where there's a sort of religious indifferentism where Christianity has its truth to say and... That's what I believed at the time. I was starting to become a little warmer to it, especially to the Trappists. Mm. I learned a little bit about Thomas Merton. Yeah. And when I was stationed in Georgia in the United States for the second time, I went to a Trappist monastery very briefly. And then also in the army, I started to have more of a positive view of Christians. They weren't the narrow-minded bigots that uh, was the stereotype in my upbringing. And moreover, I was just really impressed at how they could maintain such a strong sense of purpose while also being very humane and very warm and, and heartfelt. These were some of the things that I was trying to research through different personal growth gurus and things like that to figure out how to do that. Whereas these Christians just seem to have a natural way of doing it. Mm. Um, and then... Uh, I listened to a few Trappist monks talk about Christianity. I, I learned a little bit about contemplative prayer. But like you were saying, I, I just viewed it as one truth among many. Um, Thomas Merton, how much research did you do into him? I, I, I really, really loved his book, uh, Seven Story Mountain. Yes. Excellent writer. Um, some of his sort of little maxims are, are terrific. Uh, but I understand he got involved somewhat in Buddhism, maybe just a respectful interest. What's your opinion of how that, how Thomas Merton's life sort of ended? So I don't I mean how he died, but... I didn't read much of his work. 
But when I did sit down to read his work, actually, I just haphazardly opened it right to the portion where he was talking about Buddhism and also his forays into neo-Marxism. Oh, wow. Yep. And uh, I had already explored all those things. I could see why he was enticed by it because there were some of the same things that enticed me into it at first. But there were a lot of problems that... Uh, that was a dark rabbit hole that I could see him going down. Mm. And it was kind of naive to put a lot of stock in those things, I think. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, you know, Th Thomas Aquinas, when he talks about other gods, uh, he's pretty clear, as is scripture, that these are demons. These aren't just sort of different faces of the one true father. These are demonic. And um, I wonder if Christians don't take that seriously enough. We see these different oh, images. No. Um, for example, I'm sure you'll know the answer to this. Who's that uh, multi-armed elephant Hindu thing? Ganesh. Tell, tell us about that. Uh, if I remember correctly, he's the god of good luck. Okay, so he is a demon. <laughs> yeah. or, or, or a mere illusion, but any sort of, uh, sort of a religious reverence we may give to an illusion in that sort of form, I don't see how that isn't demonic. It's... At a minimum, it is certainly misplaced reverence. Okay. You're absolutely right. And St. Augustine in City of God says that the good pagans are worshiping angels. Ah, okay. Which is still misplaced. Yes. And also, I think his definition of good pagans is very narrow given the rest of his theology. So yes. it's only a very small portion of uh, very ethically good pagans who are actually worshiping the, the good side of these things. But... Because they don't have revelation, and because of uh, because of other problems, it, they're they're just opening to these spiritual things without really understanding them. It gets heavily perverted by the demonic. You're so right. Ganesh is that the name? Ganesh. Yeah, uh, do you know much about this figure? You say the god of good luck. Um, you're allowed to say no. I mean, I'm asking yeah. you a lot here, but well, he was an elephant, so. I thought that was kind of ridiculous to <laughs> yeah, right. revere something like that. Yeah. And uh, I I didn't practice his pose much. So I, I didn't get much very okay. interested in him. What I was interested in was warrior pose. Yeah. And uh, there was another one, Kali pose, that also seemed to have a lot of interest for me. Later on, I did more research into these to try and understand. Like I was saying, Carl Jung talks about the symbolic version of these things, and he really emphasizes how the, the symbols really do change your soul in a major way. It, it, what symbols you, you revere, and even just doing small acts of reverence to them, mm. even just imitating them, does change your soul in a major way. And, and a lot of psychologists have talked about this. There's a lot of neuroscience to support it in how, for example... Uh, our brains process 11 million bits of data every second, but only 40 of those are conscious. Hmm. So there's wow. a lot going out there. Wow. Yeah, yeah. You can see this in your own experience. I mean, when you allow yourself to fall in love with somebody, you go through a lot of changes that aren't what you intend. Yeah. You may think love is going to be this way and I'm going to grow as a person this way, but... It's a great point. There's other things. When new soldiers come into the army, they think it's going to be a certain way, maybe maybe for movies or something like that. They intend to get some things out of it, but it changes them in more ways than just what they intend. A lot of them are very uh, fresh-faced and kind of get this deer-in-headlights look if, if that's too far from what they were expecting. Let, let me ask you sort of a direct question that I'm sure many people who are watching this video want to know. Um, let's say there's someone watching right now and they're sore and their chiropractor or uh, better yet, physical therapist has told them, uh, you know, you really should go do some yoga at the Y. What's your answer to them if you could speak to them? I would tell them to do Pilates okay. instead. Don't do yoga, you're saying? Don't do yoga. Definitely not do yoga. Do not do yoga. That's okay. Don't do yoga. Right now. now, okay, so the response to that sometimes is, okay, fine, I get that this stuff can have sort of religious... Uh, undertones and, and and it can even be something of a gateway drug but look i just know this woman and her name's gladys and she has blue <laughs> hair and she's super limber and she just wants to teach me some yoga but she's not talking about cleansing my aura or chakras or anything like that why can't i do that that kind of stuff is right there beneath the surface of it so 
the first thing I would say is, yes, these things are just exercises on their own. Like I was saying at the beginning, a lot of these actually came from Western gymnastics. Mm -hmm. uh, Krishnamurti brought them in about 100 years ago to, to yoga. There are some asanas that probably come from earlier on in yogic history. There's uh, paintings and, and there's actually a major debate in academia about the extent to which these different exercises come from gymnastics versus yoga. And Interesting. Like that. Yeah. So what we're not saying is that certain bodily positions are intrinsically evil. Right. It's not as if the demons uh, have a claim on how we move our arms and legs and backs and things. The, the body isn't intrinsically good. I mean, in the Christian tradition, uh, it participates in the glory of the soul by overflow, is the term that Thomas Aquinas uses. Our soul directly participates with God, but the body participates by overflow. And yoga did show me how the body can be used to glorify these things you know the the way that we manifest ourselves physically can show importance to different things it can show our our awareness our astuteness it can show our sense of purpose mm -hmm. you know, that's why militaries for a long time trained people to sit a certain way and, yeah. and do things in rugby you really need to do things a certain way uh, i met a lot of australians as i was playing rugby <laughs> yeah and, and the way that even just you look and you move can have an impact on other people, yeah. on their soul. Okay, so uh, no to yoga, yes to Pilates. What's the difference? The problem with yoga is that the second that you intend to participate in, a, in something like that, then you bring on the other things with it. Then you open yourself to those other things. Then the bodily postures can become gateways to the things that it's talking about regardless of your subjective intent in doing it. Why does that have to be the case though? So there is an objective quality to our actions that goes beyond just our subjective intent. Like I was talking about earlier, there's lots of influences with the unconscious. When we fall in love with somebody, it affects our unconscious in ways we don't subjectively intend. Now, the first thing I would say to, to show people this is that yoga does claim to not be a religion and, and to just be exercise sometimes. But we have to be skeptical of these claims because it is very commercial. And mindfulness is a $1.1 billion industry. And my yoga spiritual director was very, very good, but he charged me a lot of money for it. Uh, one, one commentator has termed mindfulness mick mindfulness because of how it's become a great industry. Mm -hmm. So let me ask you this. When McDonald's says that its hamburgers are the tastiest out there and will make you fall in love or something, I'm <laughs> loving it is the motto. Do you take those claims at face value? Uh, no, I disbelieve them. Yes. Yeah. So it's, it's similar with yoga. I mean, we have to treat some of these claims as very commercial. Okay. As sort of the, similar to the claims that we have in commercials. Um, I just want to push you a bit here. Suppose... Uh, I'm online and I see some kind of stretch. Turns out to be a yoga stretch, but I didn't know that. And so I, I do it and it helps my back a great deal. And then you come to me and you say, I've got a sore lower back. And I'm like, well, I did this stretch and it really helped. Do this. Am I teaching you yoga? That's a good question. It starts to get into murky waters, but I'd say once, if you just see a body posture online and you're not really intending to do yoga, you're not at a formal yoga class and you don't say in your mind, I'm going to intend to do yoga, then you're probably not opening it up to it. That would be a good question for a lot of uh, theologians to, to but, answer. Because the reason I ask that is because otherwise it sounds like you're saying uh, Hinduism has a monopoly on certain body postures. Oh, no, uh, definitely not. Once you put your intent behind it, then... I, you start to participate in the these Hindu rituals. Okay. And the the proofs for that, you don't have to take my word for it. <clears throat> for example, I mentioned before Kali pose. If you go on Yoga Journal, which is the main source for yoga information in the United States, you'll find an article there that says that Kali pose, that goddess pose, as they call it, invokes Kali. They changed the name to goddess pose to make it for to make it more marketable. And in the article, it actually uses the term invoke Kali. Of course, most people don't know what Kali is. Even when I was doing the pose and they called it Kali pose, I didn't know who Kali was. But 
if you just Google her, you'll see a, a very fierce goddess with a necklace of severed human heads and a loincloth of severed human arms, triumphantly standing over a decapitated corpse that uh, she's just topped off the head of. So this is a very fierce uh, demon. I was pretty put off by that once I found it. Yeah. It made me much more skeptical of some of the claims that they have. And then when I was doing these postures, I could just sort of feel myself becoming more like them. You know, people imitate uh, tennis players to play tennis, and then they sort of become more like them in a way if you have a really close relationship with a tennis instructor. It can be the same way with these people where because you're sort of making them role models, you become closer to them. And I could feel that changing some of my emotional disposition to be closer to them. Another good example is warrior pose, uh, Virabhadra. So warrior pose is named after uh, a Hindu mythical warrior named Virabhadra. What happened is that he was created by Shiva. Shiva's wife was angry at her father, Shiva's father-in-law, because her father didn't invite her to some sacrifice. So she actually committed suicide. Shiva was so distraught at this that he created Viabhadra to get revenge on his father-in-law. Now, warrior pose is a three-part, three-series pose. In the first one, he puts his arms up in the air. That's him sprouting out of the ground near his target. In the second one, he sees his target. It's in his sights. And then in the third one, he lunges for his target and decapitates him. Wow. So... Hiring a hitman to murder your father-in-law is pretty serious business and uh, not something I wanted to get too involved How in. How interesting. Yeah, that's. Uh, thank you for clearing that up. Yeah, I suppose you could say that it would be as problematic, and if you agree with this, for a Catholic to practice yoga as it would be problematic to a Hindu's Hinduism to come and practice Catholic rituals. Like, no, come kneel down. You'll, you'll notice. And, and we pray to Mary. We would in intend that she hears us. And, and, and this will just help you. This, and you could see somebody like really commercializing Catholicism, almost uh, uh, prima facie, uh, uh, gutting it of its religious significance. But this is clearly Catholic acts that the, the Hindu would be engaging in in this thought experiment. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of like saying come participate in mass, receive the Eucharist just to make you feel better. Yeah. And just to enjoy the, the nice singing. I mean, yeah. that's all well and good to come to mass for those reasons, but there's a lot more happening. Okay, that's there. a great analogy. Yeah. With the sacraments, there's much more happening that we're not conscious of. Yeah. I mean, we were just, uh, I was just talking earlier with my fiance about how she realized St. Elizabeth of the Trinity was interceding for her recently but she realized it a, a long while after the intercessions actually happen. Mm. It takes a while sometimes to recognize the actual spiritual effects. When you put your trust in something, it does have big implications. And you get a lot more from them than you think you're getting, than you're aware that you're getting. That's true for anything. Who you put your trust in matters a lot. And if you put your trust in these yogic gods like, gods like Kali and Virabhadra, then it becomes problematic. Now, I actually don't know what Pilates is. <laughs> so, so when I'm asking you, what is Pilates? I'm not asking you for like a deep, <laughs> like yeah. I just don't even know. I, I, it has something to do with stretching. But like, what? why would you suggest if someone's like, well, I want to do yoga because yeah, I'm sore and this, this has helped me. What is Pilates and why would you tell them to do that? Pilates was founded by Mr. Yosef Pilates back about 100 years ago at around the same time that modern Hatha Yoga was coming with Krishnamurti. And he also based it a lot in the Western <clears throat> gymnastics movement at the time. He basically wanted to get a lot of the movements from Western gymnastics to help people <clears throat> prepare for it. So what it does do that's really good is it helps you to gain more alignment and gain more flexibility with your movements, be more conscious of them, but also in a way that synchronizes those movements with your breathing. What that allows you to do is to really go deep into your neuromuscular programming to really realign your body in a good way. Okay, but it's not based on Hindu or other pagan religions? No, it's really based on sort of Western gymnastics. And uh, his, I think his father was a gymnastics instructor and his mother was a naturopath, healer. <laughs> okay. 
So it's rooted in those two ways of thinking. Now, if someone's like, okay, I'll go to Pilates, but the same lady who teaches yoga is the only one in town who teaches Pilates. Can I go to this yoga instructor for Pilates? I would say yes. I mean, like we were saying earlier, it's not like <clears throat> Hinduism has monopoly over these postures. Mm -hmm. You can do them as Pilates, but if she starts doing yoga, then I would get away from that. What would be some sort of uh, buzzwords that we should consider red flags uh, from, the, from the instructor? If they start umming, or if they start speaking in the kind of very weird yoga voice. What's that sound? Well, you may not want to do it, but what is the weird yoga voice? The weird yoga voice is a very kind of therapy voice where you speak in this kind of, oh, I'm just going to grab your hips in a very awkward way, and it wouldn't be okay unless I was using this voice to do it. Ah. There's a lot of weird touching in yoga classes, but they do the voice to sort of make it seem like it's okay. I see. Once they start doing weird things like that, then I would go yeah. away from it. When they start umming or make references to some of the Sanskrit parts of yoga, to the Sanskrit gods and goddesses, the Sanskrit names. Oh, this is cool. Hmm. What was I going to ask you? Yoga. How, how did you start getting in like getting away from it and why did you start getting away from it so first i i should say that i i hired a really good yoga spiritual director i think that his spiritual direction was about as good as you can get in yoga i mean i looked at a lot of different teachers and i talked to a lot of people about their teachers and he was an, an excellent teacher he started off actually as a fitness trainer but he learned from a lot of uh, very prominent people. I mean, one of his teachers was Adi Das's greatest student, for example. Adi Das was a major figure in Western yoga. He was one of the first people to bring it to the West in, in a major way. And I started to work with him in a way that started to get beyond a lot of these problems we were talking about. Mm -hmm. He started to help me see the, the destructiveness of just kind of doing what you feel the, the heart can be very deceiving, as it says in scripture. Some more rigorous yoga teachers will admit this when they, uh, they say things like the heart has many feelings rooted in ignorance. Mm -hmm. So he started to help me see the, the importance of this and, and help make my practice more rigorous. And this was also when I started at Yale that I hired him. Now... Yale was a place where there was a lot of these types of beliefs going around. There was a lot of postmodernism, the, the same beliefs from the, the Cultural Revolution in the 1960s that I had encountered in the yoga world. But I was starting to get dissatisfied with yoga at the time, and I was also pretty dissatisfied with things that were happening at Yale. There was a lot of criticisms of the military that were very unfair. Um, and there was a lot of criticisms of policing that I also thought were very unfair based on a lot of the firsthand experience I had and the research I was doing in mm -hmm. policing at the time. So I, I started to get dissatisfied with that. That led me to really throw myself into these yoga teachings in a big way. I started to more realize the importance of changing my life. I started to actually face up to that. Before, I had this idea that you know, I was entitled to my own lifestyle and I could just live however I wanted. And like you were saying earlier, that's a very common view out in secular society. But and it's not easy to then make a, a strong commitment to actually moving towards something more. It's not easy to make a strong commitment to the demands of, of a more ethical life, to structure your life in a way that turns it towards what's most important. That he really started to get me to see the importance of these things hmm. and how good it was to start to change some of the ways that I was doing things to change my habits more towards the towards realizing good things. I started to meditate every morning. I started to uh, set some boundaries on my smartphone. We were talking about that earlier, how smartphones can really suck up. The way I understood at the time was smartphones can really suck up a lot of your consciousness, mm -hmm. sort of degrade the, the quality of your consciousness yep. if, uh, if they dominate your life too much. 
because then you're not as present in mm -hmm. your actual life, what's going on at the time. So I started to put more boundaries on that. And that was good because it did actually start to, I did start to gain more contemplative intuition at the time. At the same time, Yale was honing my thinking mm -hmm. in a lot of different areas. So I was studying a lot of interesting parts of constitutional law. I was doing a lot of interesting police research. That all made me realize, got me thinking about things like human dignity in a much more rigorous way and also how to organize cultural life in a good way. What are some really important values to build a culture around that lead to things like good community policing? I was asking these questions and doing a lot of research into them. So once, so I was asking probing intellectual questions about important aspects of life with contemplative intuition. The first thing that opened me up to Christianity was actually this yoga spiritual director. He mentioned Christ is just a good example of that because Christ was willing to offer himself so completely as a sacrifice, mm -hmm. taking the burdens of everyone else, the suffering of everyone else onto himself so that he could raise us up towards more truth and love, mm -hmm. freeing us from the bonds of what kept us back from it. Mm -hmm. I didn't believe in necessarily in his divinity at the time or anything like that, but I was just really impressed by his sense of purpose and how he was willing to do that for everyone else. It was really impressive for the sake of greater truth and love. So that opened me up to the possibility of Catholicism. <clears throat> Once I was to the possibility of Christianity in general. Once I started to give it a fair chance, and I was asking questions with some intellectual rigor and with the still heart of contemplation of meditating, then Catholicism very quickly became the only answer. And this is while you were at Yale? Yes. Now, where did you direct your questions? How did you learn about Catholicism? I didn't really have that good of a uh, avenue to. I had one friend from the rugby team who was a big help, and then his friends also who were studying at Yale gave me a good model of the uh, Catholic life. And I realized also later on that they were praying for me at the time because they had some intuition that I was really seeking. Mm. So their help was very much appreciated. And uh, he sort of helped me wrap my mind around a few issues. For example, I, I was frustrated because I thought that the police were being scapegoated. The more I did my research into these things, the more I realized some of the systematic problems that people were talking about were general problems that weren't just the fault of the rank and file police, but they were being blamed with them. And I was telling him about this. He said, oh yes, in, in Catholicism, we only have one scapegoat and that's Christ mm. for everyone. I realized, oh, that makes for a good cultural system. <laughs> Those are some good values for, yeah. for having good cultural life because then you can have ethical rigor you can actually like rise towards something good, but you're not then so puritanical and harsh on people when they, they fail in those things. Sounds pretty good to me. Yeah. They, they modeled the prayer life pretty well. They invited me to some good parties. They had good alcohol at those parties. Uh, I realized later on that Catholicism has some of the best alcohol. I'd spent two years in Germany and uh, I really got into German beer. Like, mm -hmm. Everyone likes Hofbrau when they first get there, which is the, the secular court beer. Hof literally means the, the court beer or the crown beer. But then once you really get into it, you usually find one of the other breweries. Mine was Augustina Brau, mm -hmm. which was originally brewed by the Augustinians. And then I also like Tegense, which was brewed by the Benedictines at Tegense mm -hmm. in Germany. So they just modeled a really nice, good Catholic cultural life. Then the, the second major source for me was St. Teresa of Avila. Mm. I really was valued the contemplative life. I really saw its value. Yoga was showing me the importance of it. But at the same time, I, I saw that there were a lot of problems. You know, yoga con contemplation can't open you up in a deep, like, it's good to go deeper into contemplation. But the deeper you go, the more you become open to some of these things that we were talking about earlier, some of these bad influences. And there's even more bad influences that uh, I can talk about later that are, are even more problematic than this. Um, 
So because I value the contemplative life, I just Googled good book on Catholic contemplation because I knew they had monasteries, but I didn't really know if they had a sophisticated... And you had already been to that Trappist monastery by this point? I'd already been to the Trappist monastery. Yeah, so there was some sense of respect that you had towards Catholicism. Yep. All right. So, and and what book did you find by Teresa? I read a book about her, The Fulfillment of All Desire by Ralph Martin. Oh, that's incredible. I just had him on the show a couple of weeks ago. Oh, what a guy. The Fulfillment of All Desire. And I actually, the first book I read was um, a different one just by about her and St. John of the Cross. Fire Within by Thomas Dubé. Fire Within by Thomas Dubé. And that one was excellent. I mean, yeah. just from picking it up in the first page, I can yeah, say, Yeah, because he sort of critiques and contrasts sort of Buddhism mysticism to Christian mysticism, doesn't he? Almost right away. He does, and his contrasts are right on. And I was coming from it at that point, so I thought that maybe, like you were saying, he could set up straw man arguments. Yeah. But like Aquinas, he was very honest about setting up... Steel men. Yeah, steel men. Not straw men. <laughs> exactly. To the extent that you can, I mean, there's a lot of people that might say, oh, well, this isn't true for my form of yoga sure. because it's like this, but there's a you tremendous can't cover everything. Yeah. 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 When, I, when I talk about these things, I'm mostly talking about mindfulness, the way it's practiced here, and Kashmiri Shaivism, which is the most prominent form practiced in the West. It's okay. what birthed Hatha Yoga, which is the main type of yoga in the West. The second most prominent form in the West is Kundalini Yoga, which is also from Kashmiri Shaivism. Now, t- t- speak a little about mindfulness, because uh, just like uh, there's nothing inherently wrong with certain bodily postures, especially without intent, and uh, surely deciding to be aware of my body and aware of the present moment, this could be defined as mindfulness, and I doubt you would say that's wrong. Well, I definitely not. And that's a a strong vein in the Catholic tradition. The Desert Fathers talked about watchfulness. Mm -hmm. And St. Teresa of Avila gives us one of her first counsels for prayer to just cultivate a basic attentiveness in your prayer. Yeah, recollection too is another word she uses. Recollection is very important. And I didn't realize it, but that's what a lot of the yogic exercises I was doing actually were, were active recollection and St. Teresa praises this greatly. Explain how someone can be actively recollected if they haven't heard this terminology before. So recollection is where you really go into your soul and ground yourself more there so that you're more focused on what's important and more there with the presence of God in your soul. You can do recollection in lesser forms, for example, where you just <clears throat> recollect your thoughts, where you go into your head for a second to organize your thoughts. Mm. You know, all right, I, I'm not really sure where to proceed from here. Let me organize my thoughts, and then we can think about this in a better way. That's recollection of the mind. Recollection of the soul is where you do something similar with your whole spirit. Okay. Wait, so what's your response when people say, like, what's your opinion on Catholic mindfulness? That gets very dicey because usually it's associated with the mindfulness that's in secular society. The term mindfulness itself can just mean being aware of your mind. Being mindful just means sort of being conscious of what's happening. There's nothing intrinsically wrong with terms like awareness and consciousness. It's just that they kind of use a big hand wave and say, well, consciousness is the divine and that's everything and that's what everything is reducible to. And then they use Buddhist techniques to realize that. You don't have to take my word for that again. Also, just look at uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who's the father of modern mindfulness. He is a doctor, and he's really the the leading figure in the modern mindfulness movement. Mm. Now, John Kabat-Zinn himself, in an interview, said, I assiduously avoid using the word secular, because once you use the term secular, you abstract the sacred out of it. Mindfulness is not secular, according to this guy, the father of mindfulness, Mm. and it's a practice to realize the sacred. John Kabat-Zinn was trained by Buddhists. He was a Zen Buddhist, actually. And he admits that his teachings, that mindfulness is the essence of Buddhism. Mm. So he's basically just 
taking a part of Buddhism, stripping it down, which Zen is already a very stripped down form of Buddhism, and then attaching his own stamp to it and bringing it to the West. So, so would you prefer then that somebody use the term instead of Catholic mindfulness, watchfulness, or recollection? Because it's yes. you're kind of you're blurring you're blurring into something else when you talk about Catholic mindfulness. Is that your thought? Yes, I think Catholic recollection would especially be a really good term mm. because recollection is something that's sorely needed. You know, when we're so busy and moving this way and that way and on our smartphones constantly, it really harms our recollection. And that's one of the basic contemplative practices that can do so much good for lay people out in the world. Yeah, okay. Yeah, that's cool. All right, so you're, you're reading this book uh, by Thomas Dubay and then our friend Ralph Martin. Um, at what point did you encounter the Dominicans? Right after Yale, I deployed to Afghanistan, actually, hmm. to apply my police research there. I was working on staff this time in Kabul, not on the front lines in Kandahar province, like my first tour. While I was there, I, I had decided that I wanted to convert right before deploying. I approached a Czech military priest while I was in Kabul. And actually, to his credit, he was very skeptical at first of me because he thought, oh, maybe he's in war. That's sort of leading him to want to make these drastic life decisions. We want to make sure that this is actually a really firm choice, a firm commitment that he's well thought through. Mm -hmm. But then I, I talked to him about all the different things I'd gone through and my understanding of the Catholic faith. And so then he started working with me. I also had help from an American deacon of the Archdiocese of Arlington, who was deployed as a contractor there. I just read the catechism to get a sense of the faith, and I was really impressed by it. It's incredible what do you call it? Document, book, catechism. It's absolutely incredible. Oh, yes. I mean, it, they just offer so many great truths that have been carefully pruned over 2,000 years of discourse between people who have really consecrated their whole lives to the truth. Yeah. In, in a way, and I say this loosely, it's like a modern Summa Theologiae because the footnotes are, I mean, you, we're just sort of drawing upon the wisdom of the saints to show the teachings of the Catholic Church. And, and those saints have been people who have developed themselves in, in every way. You know, they're not just people who are good academics, but they really led lives of holiness. Yes. They committed themselves entirely to God, mm. to, to his truth. It's been over lots of time and culture. And St. Augustine was a, a bear bear. St. Thomas Aquinas, Italian. St. Teresa of Villa was Spanish. Mm. And those are all people cited prominently in the catechism. It answered so many different questions. And like you said, the footnotes were so rich. I mean, I spent a lot of time just looking at the people in the footnotes, trying to figure out who are these people, what motivated them. <laughs> who is this Thomas Aquinas fellow? And some of the lesser known ones are from the Middle East. Yep. Who are cited in there. Origin is a yeah, fascinating yeah. figure. I just read the Wikipedia articles on these guys. You know, it's not like I was reading pro right. Catholic sources necessarily, right. but I was just so impressed yeah. by the lives that they led. So now as you're looking into Catholicism, and is this essentially RCIA that you're going through with this deacon and priest? Informal RCIA so in Afghanistan. Yeah. I don't mean to keep bringing your parents into it because I presume they're still alive and I, I don't mean to have you talk about things you'd rather not talk about. But what, what, how did they take this? You're, you're getting serious about Christianity and Catholicism in particular. Secular society really claims to be respectful of all the choices that people make. <laughs> this is not true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and no, no. they do sort of give their assent to these kinds of things at first, but then often that leads to a lot of weirdness afterwards. So it was okay with my family. I mean, they were respectful at first, but it, it was also a, a little bit hard on them because they didn't really understand where I was going and they had their own preconceived notions about some of these things. Okay. Well, I, uh, I want to I take a break. And Neil, what we'll do is we'll just do the two-minute break. We won't do the ad. Um, and then when we come back, I got there's a ton of questions I know we're going to have in, in the comment section. I'd love to get into that. Anything else you want to touch, touch upon? Sure thing. All right, cool. Thanks, Neil. Okay, we're back. I'm going to start with an ASMR drink. Well deserved. 
I apologise to everybody watching. Have you? Did you go down the ASMR world? <laughs> Are you familiar with it? No. Oh, okay. No. Well, that made no sense to you. Um, I, I don't even know what it means, ASMR. Audio sensory something or other. Yeah, I would recommend people not check it out. <laughs> but it's like, it's basically people... Like, you can, you can go on YouTube and watch people eating fried chicken into a microphone. You imagine how disgusting that would be if someone did that in your ear? But at the same time, it's kind of cool. You know what I mean? A little bit? No? Gross? You know how you're kind of annoyed, but in a cool way? Like, stop kicking my chair, but it also kind of feels good. No? All right. Well, anyway. The goal is to get that, like, tingly spine. Yeah. Tingly spine thing. That's the goal. Well, that's sort of one of the goals of yoga. Oh. I mean, it's very much about taking your bodily senses and also some senses of your soul and then manipulating them in a way that you can get these sort of tingly nice feelings hmm. in your spine hmm. and that can open you up to even weirder things um do you were at stanford i mean the dominicans go to these you know domestic institute did you meet a dominican there when you were there or no no so I how did you did. how did you get hooked up with the dominicans in dc after i returned from afghanistan this uh swiss friend from the rugby team uh, Sam, he advised that I look up the Dominicans because he said they're very learned. I only knew about the Carmelites at the time. So I I uh, just Googled Dominicans in Washington, D.C. and then emailed them and said, hey, I've already undergone some catechesis in Afghanistan and I want to convert. Hmm. Uh, the prior, actually, Father Aquinas Gulboa met with me a few times and completed my catechesis. Hmm. He uh, corrected some of the misperceptions I had from my yogic thinking mm. on some things, but it, in a way that was very uh, good. I mean, he had a lot of very interesting justifications for these things rooted in especially Aristotelian epistemology and, mm -hmm. and philosophy, not only that. So it, it really helped to transform my thinking and and get me to see just the, the wonder of all the well-integrated theology that, mm. that the Catholic Church bases everything on. I'm going to put this maybe offensively, but I think it's true. How did Aquinas sober you up from your yoga drunkenness? <laughs> That's certainly accurate. I mean, a, a lot of the, the yogis were drunk, frankly, some of them. Um, and the, there's one story I should tell you about drunken yogis. It's actually how Hatha Yoga was founded. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, so first I'll say Aquinas was just very good because he's very grounded and no nonsense. Mm -hmm. you know, he really brings a lot of specificity and he does it in a way that's so related to everything else. All these other systems that I was looking into before had a part of the truth. Mm. They all had little bits of the truth. And I was attracted to them because the whatever I was studying before had some good things, but then I would get a little disillusioned with it because it would bring up new issues and problems once the old ones were solved. And then I'd say, oh, this next new thing solves these other issues and, that I had before, but then a whole new crop of issues would come up. So each of them had a small portion of the truth, but failed as a complete system. Yeah. And, and I imagine too, that as you're sort of assessing these different worldviews or schools of thought, they're all sort of joined together with this sort of mysterious nothing, which you just refer to in mystical language because there's yeah. nothing to connect it all together. Yeah, there is just some vague notion of consciousness. Right. The, there's, okay, you can be conscious of something, but I have no idea what to do with it. I mean, I can be aware of an object, but it's another thing to interpret it. Yeah. It's another thing to form a uh, intention towards it, yep. and then it's another thing to actualize that intention. So there are three very different things mm. that all seem to have to happen. But drunken yoga. All right. So this is the way that Hatha Yoga was founded. Now remember that Hatha Yoga is the most common form of yoga in the West right now. The second most common form is Kundalini Yoga, okay. which is similar, and they <clears throat> both stem from Kashmiri Shaivism. Okay. Let me let me take a step back. <laughs> okay. And and this will illustrate something very interesting. So Kashmiri Shaivism refers to Kashmir the place. Okay. And then Shaivism refers to Shiva. Shiva is one of their gods, and he is the aloof first principle, the, the judge of everything. That is similar to the father in our understanding. There's an analogy to the father. I'm not saying he is the yeah. father, of course. <clears throat> the, there's 
three other major strains of Hinduism. Shaivism is one of the major large families of Hinduism, and then there's three other major families of it. The second one is Shaktiism. Shaktiism is the pure flowing life force, the life energy, the giver of life that animates all of creation. That's similar to the Holy Spirit. Vaishnavism is the third one. They have the most impressive monastic tradition, and they worship Vishnu, who has incarnated several times, depending on the sect, in order to set things right on earth. So he's the god that comes down to redeem the earth. That's similar to Christ. Mm. The fourth major branch of Hinduism, which isn't very prominent, is called Smartism. That takes these three gods and then attempts to sort of integrate them in a trinity-like mm. structure where there's Brahman and Atman, which are the, they're, they're two slightly different terms. And I forget which one is the fundamental ground, but there's the fundamental sort of Godhead the essence of God, and then these are the three persons of God. But then they also tack on clumsily two other gods, including Ganesh, the elephant god. Mm. So an elephant is one of the persons of God in Smartism, this, this last Hindu branch. That seems to me to parallel the Trinity mm -hmm. in an interesting way. Of, of course, the, be very careful with these kinds of analogies. But I think what this is showing is just that there's some truth to the, its evidence for the Catholic Trinity. But because they didn't have the grace of revelation, because they didn't have God's grace, they couldn't arrive at a complete notion of it. Okay. It's like Thomas Aquinas says, you can arrive at a understanding of God through natural reason, but you can't arrive at certain doctrines of the church otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> This is probably says more about my baseness than anything, but drunken yoga. So, <laughs> Kashmiri Shaivism. This is the Shaivism is the most common form of yoga, and Kashmiri Shaivism, I would say, is the most impressive kind. It had its heyday around uh, 1000 AD with this teacher named Abhinava Gupta, but then the Muslims started to invade India after that, and that was a very, very difficult thing for the Indians. That's an understatement. The Muslim invasion of India was one of the most brutal invasions in all of history. Hmm. Uh, conflict is my other major area, and I've, I've studied lots of different types of conflicts. So the Muslim invasion of India was not pretty. One of the first places they invaded was Kashmir. This absolutely devastated the institutional support for Kashmiri Shaivism. They used to have impressive monasteries and, and impressive academic and theological discourse. But that devastated all that. So the Kashmiri Shaivistic gurus spread out to different parts of India. This is in the 12th and 13th century in India. One of them was named Matsayandra. Now, you remember how yoga is a lot about becoming more aware of different mm -hmm. feelings and currents in the soul and then manipulating them for the purpose of your own awareness. Mm -hmm. Now, that's very ruthlessly focused on your own awareness on enhancing consciousness and the ethics around it can be a little relativistic i mean they they have some system of ethics but it, it's not as complete as the ones that we're used to so what this guru did is he used his magical yoga occult powers to infiltrate a king's palace seduce the king's wife and then have his way with the king's 1600 dancing girls huh. and also the king's wine supply so he was cavorting with wine and women. Mm. And he was approached by a very ardent student named Garakshanath. The ardent student approached him without any judgment while the guru was cavorting with wine and women at the time and thereby gained initiation from the guru. Then Garakshanath brought the guru out of this state of affairs killed the son that the guru had had with the queen and then skinned the son. Hence symbolizing yogic purification. Now, after this rampage of murder, of fraud, of corpse desecration, of probable mass sexual slavery, probable uh, mass rape, they went on to found Hatha Yoga. This the this the disciple and this other fella. Matsayandra and Garakshanath. Exactly. Yeah. 
Well, and this is this is the foundings of of yoga in the West. Very different than the foundings of Christianity. Yes. Christ wow. came to sacrifice himself in order to raise us up, whereas this guy just kind of errantly went trying to raise up his own personal power to empower himself and went into an errantness of drunkenness. Uh, so since I can't pronounce him, I'm just going to refer to him as this other fellow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so when you say he went into this kingdom and seduced the king's wife, uh, you may have alluded to this and I missed it, but how did he even do that? How did he breach the kingdom? So I looked up three different sources on this. A lot of it now is shrouded in mystery. One of the things I realized when I came to Catholicism is just how well documented our foundation is, hmm. uh, especially vis-a-vis -vis other sources of the ancient world. I yeah. studied a lot of ancient history and we don't have nearly as many witnesses to a lot of other important events uh, from the time period. And this is no exception in that there's not very good sources that get into a lot of specifics with it. But I looked it up in three different sources because I was so shocked by the story. What it appears from these sources, and, and I am reading into them a little bit based on my experience with yoga, is that he was just able to manipulate his consciousness in such a way as to earn the trust of the king. Mm -hmm. When you are so attuned to the the currents in your soul and you have these technical these finely honed technical practices then it is possible at that point to just sort of convince people of things and gain their trust and to to do it in a way that is very self-serving though okay well that's fascinating i had no idea it gets into even darker areas let's do it so sorry that was to, let's try this to edit that out and I'll try it again. Let's do it. <sighs> we well, definitely should be zealous about getting this stuff out there because it is important for people to know. Yeah. Now, Are we going back in time or forward in time? Forward in time. Okay. To more recent times. There's this figure called Alistair Crawley who died in 1962. He was a major inspiration of the countercultural revolution of the 1960s and the 1970s. He was very influential in that. He was probably the West's most powerful occultist of the past couple hundred years. Mm -hmm. He got his start by studying the same form of yoga that I studied, Kashmiri Shaivism, as well as some advanced Tantric Buddhism, mm -hmm. as well as some neo-pagan religions. He actually thought that he was the recipient of revelation from Egyptian gods. His one rule is, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law, love shall be the whole of the law. Very Nietzsche-esque, like about just doing whatever you will, doing whatever you desire. And this is a common thread in yoga, even if the, the more traditional ones would uh, really look down on the way that he was doing this. Now, a lot of his um, revelation actually has support for child sacrifice. And he ironically bragged about it. When there, did this book live? He lived in the mostly in the first part of the 20th century. So okay. he died in 1962. And is he, he's a American? He was English. Okay. And then lived there. He traveled a good amount. Okay. But he was a yoga instructor? No. He was influenced a lot by yoga. Okay. So he's very much a figure like this Matsyandra. <clears throat> okay. And a lot of his occult powers came from studying the same form of yoga. He wasn't a formal yoga instructor. Okay. This is one of the other things that I was saying before. You know, there's a lot of complicated different strands in yoga. It's hard to tease all of them out with yeah. one another. But what happened is, is that he, a lot of these new left things, like these neo-pagan religions, got in, integrated with yoga by figures like Aleister Crowley. And gotcha. that's the current form we're dealing with in uh. the West. Yeah, so if, as if pure yoga, yoga wasn't bad enough, you now have it mixed with these uh, yes. other sort of hedonistic and, and even demonic uh, revelations. Definitely demonic. I mean, Aleister Crowley was mixing in with some weird things. And I mean, like I was saying, he was talking about child sacrifice. How was he talking about child sacrifice in a way that was palatable to people? 
So it was in a way where he just wanted to show a lot of disdain for Christianity. Uh -huh. And at the time, that's when a lot of anti-Christian intellectual currents were gaining a lot of traction. So he talked about it in the way of sort of mocking Christian views on procreation and sexuality. And a lot of people mm -hmm. were starting to buy into this stuff at the time. You know, divorce laws were being uh, were were being liberalized. Before that, there was Schopenhauer who bragged who Schopenhauer said, for example, that um, that pederasty, you know, bad relations with young with young boys, is acceptable to avoid other mm -hmm. worse evils. For example. And he was a major influence then on Freud and Nietzsche and other people like that. So there were a lot of these intellectual currents that were starting to mock Christian sexual ethics. And so that's how Aleister Crawley did it. And mm -hmm. he bragged that he bragged that when he was uh, engaging in the conjugal act without, without the intent to procreating, that he was sacrificing children. Is how he did it. Mm -hmm. He was also a cocaine addict and a frequenter of prostitutes. Hmm. He supported both Nazism and communism at the same time because they had less of this you know, Christian slave mentality that Nietzsche would say. They're more mm -hmm. about personal empowerment and the strong mm -hmm. dominating the weak and being free of these bad constraining structures that Christianity puts on people in his view. Hmm. He had a lot of influence on especially the neo-pagan strands in the, the Cultural Revolution. There is a lot of music artists that pay homage to him. He's on one of the Beatles albums. <laughs> David Bowie, Led Zeppelin, Marilyn Manson cite him as major influences. Say, say this bloke's name again. Alistair Crawley. Alistair Crawley. Yes. And and is is he did he write anything? Is he often cited in modern Western yoga circles? Or is he more like uh, the founder of Planned Parenthood who we'd like to pretend wasn't a raging racist wicked woman? <clears throat> He's more like that, but there mm -hmm. are still some corners that cite his work and hold him up. Uh the the Gaia TV website, for example, is one of them. And that's gaining a good amount of traction in those types of circles. Um but he, he doesn't have that much direct influence on the yoga world, but they were certainly influenced by a lot of his sort of occult and neo-pagan ideas. A lot of those came from him, mm. I would say. Have you gotten the chance to perhaps go to India or at least study when you were kind of um, a yogi? Did you have the chance to study with people who weren't sort of uh, tainted by that sort of more Western element? I did not have that much chance to do that. What I did do is I looked through some of the original sources and some people who were trying to revive a more traditional approach to it. And would you say that this more, I mean, both are bad, I presume, but you, would you say that this more traditional element is, is much, much more, less bad? It's less bad, yeah. There's still some weird things that happen in the traditional element, some weird areas that people go to, like the story I told you about the foundation of yoga. <laughs> What's interesting is <clears throat> if we take the Christian story seriously and accept that the demonic is a reality, then it isn't surprising that demonic forces would co-join in order to propagate a false gospel. That's what they do. I mean, they kind of, they're very good at taking things that seem good at the beginning. And that's what was happening with me was I was going through all these different systems and I would take some parts of the truth and it would help me at first. But then they're so good at then taking what starts off as a good and perverting it mm. into something else. So when you stick with any of these things, then I think eventually they start going down a really bad rabbit hole, even if they can be helpful for a time before that. Yeah, yeah. St. Ignatius of Loyola makes this point in his spiritual exercise as well. Yeah, this is an important thing to realize. Just because something is helpful, it doesn't mean it's good. You know, like something can be helpful. I mean, I mean, Aquinas talks about this, right? Like no one chooses evil because of evil. We choose evil because of a, a, a an apparent good or a real good. Uh, you might think of, say, uh, alcohol, alcohol, right? Like you, you want a glass of beer, you want to take the edge off, you want to commune better with your friends. Uh, and this is a good thing, uh, but it can lead to something wicked. Alcoholism, for example, drunkenness. 
Marxism rightfully points out a lot of the problems with uh, capitalism, but then it yeah leads down some really bad rabbit holes after that. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, are you okay if we take some questions or is there anything else you wanted to touch on? I know this is such a massive topic and I hope you're going to write a book about this soon, <laughs> or at least one day. I've started some writing. Yeah. Uh, certainly, I, I, I hope that this, this can benefit the church. Well, it will indeed, because I before our interview, if you had have said to me, what's wrong with yoga? I think I would have said something like, well, uh, it's like a gateway drug. You know, like the, most people who are practicing yoga, it's not a big deal. They're stretching and I, I get the hesitancy or the reluctance to engage in it. But I, I, I didn't really, it, it just, when people tried to argue against it, it was sort of like when people tried to argue against Harry Potter. I'm like, okay, <laughs> maybe you're right. And, and Harry Potter's not great to read, but like the arguments you're giving aren't convincing me. Uh, but I think you've done a, a good job at sh it's kind of stepping us back uh, and showing us why it is an issue. If I can convince you, I, I'm glad for that. And Thomas yeah. Aquinas sets up steelmen, yeah. as, as you say, and, yeah. and that's really good to have. I mean, it, it is important to really put out good arguments. I was put off by Christianity at first because one of the reasons was that it seemed to just quibble over a lot of small theological issues in public that mm. didn't seem that important with me for me. But then I started to see that there there is a real deep soul to the faith, and and the things that were written by by the Carmelites, especially, combined with the Dominican technical precision, were were just amazing. Yeah, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the Jesus Prayer in the uh, Orthodox Church. Yeah, uh, but whenever you read a well, not whenever, but a lot of the time when you read about the Jesus Prayer, there is this um, condemnation of treating it as a technique as a sort of uh, a pagan Eastern technique, um, you know, so they're kind of like warning people against that. And I, I think that is a lot of people's attraction to it is when they yeah. hear about the breathing and things like this, they assume that this is kind of like Buddhism or some form of Buddhist meditation, but for Christians. Um, but, you know, I mean, part of the reason for the breath is just so you don't have to use a prayer rope. So it's like you could use a prayer rope and you don't even have to worry about your breath is what a lot of kind of Eastern Orthodox priests or monks will say. But then if you know you don't have a prayer rope, well, then you can attach it to your inhaling and exhaling, but not in a sort of mechanistic sense. Yes. There's a big danger in any of that technical sophistication that it should yeah. become a dry technical exercise. Yeah. And that was one of the first things that started to make me question yoga, at least, and, and mindfulness, is it did seem very dry and technical. Mm. So I was interested in what was really going on and what was more beyond it. and What was true. Yeah, what's true. And at first, I just realized that in order for these practices even to be effective and to make sense to do them, you need to have some worldview, some belief. You need to believe that it's important to empty yourself, that divinity is emptiness. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense to just sit and watch your breath Yeah, as a spiritual practice. You can do that to improve your mind, maybe. Uh, theoretical question. Somebody says to you, I'm going to start a Christian yoga studio. What do you say to them? N no, that's blending two things that are very contradictory to one another. You could found a Christian-inspired physical exercise that does exercise or Pilates in a Christian light that does it in a way that's more prayerful and that does it in a way that invites you to reflect on your body in, in a good Christian way. So I think that there are a lot of good Christian practices that can fill a lot of the gaps that yoga has filled that people view as missing from Christianity, but isn't true. Mm. For example, the, the Carmelites have great contemplative prayer and recollection like we were just talking about. Right. And then another area that I found is in scripture, I realized that there's a good amount of references to your relationship to your body, for example. It'd be very easy just to do Lectio Divina on those. Mm. I have one written uh, that I've talked about with my fiance that's uh, <clears throat> called The Body of Mary, where I meditate on different things that she happened and sort of the emotions that she must have been feeling when she mm. did the visitation yeah. and things like that. And there'd be a good, another good one for men based on Christ. Now, I, I, I just assume this must exist, though I don't know for sure. I haven't looked into it, but there must be people out there who have been like, all right, 
yoga. I get the problem with it. So I'm going I'm to create essentially a Christian yoga where I come up with certain movements and sort of uh, sort of associate them with maybe the Bible or like, you know, the resurrection and people are doing things with their arms and hands and things like this. That's got to exist, does it? I don't know. I promise any. it must. It has to exist. <laughs> you don't think? You're not sure. You're not sure or you think it doesn't? I promise it exists. You type in Christian yoga, I, there's someone somewhere making bank, and even not in a negative sense, just kind of making a living by... So is that a problem? If you then brought in explicit yoga things, then it would not be a problem. But if you brought explicit yoga things, then it would be a problem? Then it would be a problem. Yeah. Yes, it would be a problem, certainly. If you called it Christian yoga or just did any yoga intentionality or called the pose virabhad asana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then you're invoking... What if you're using Latin terms? Yeah, that would be a good way to do it. Okay, so there's, there's a way to do it. But yeah, but I see what you mean. Like Christian yoga, I mean, it's kind of like uh, once you realize the origins of yoga and the, the Hinduism with which it's associated, not to mention these other things, you might just want to stay away from the term yoga. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yoga, the term means to yoke. And you are yoking yourself to something spiritually, even if you don't subjectively intend to do that. Okay. Just not the best things. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. That's, that's really helpful. Um, all right. We might take some questions, Neil. Yeah. Okay. So we have a question from a dose of theosis. Yeah, my boy, Derek. They are asking, much of the questions my son goes to an evangelical church preschool and they sometimes do kids yoga as an exercise. Could I be concerned? Can, can they hear your voice through that? Or do I need to repeat it? Um, you'll need to repeat he's, it. He's asking about, uh, he sends his kid to an evangelical kid uh, Christian school, and his kids are doing yoga? They have kids yoga. Kids yoga. Was, as an exercise. Should he be concerned? Yes, definitely. Okay. There is for, room for... For all the reasons you've said. I mean, it's pretty clear at this point in the interview. <laughs> Yeah, so there, there's room for doing slower exercise through Pilates, and that would be good for children, but not yoga. Okay. Uh, here's a question from Ruthushka. Um, uh, for you, Alex, how does coming to the church change the way you look back at your military service and deployment or your time abroad? Thanks for your service. We're in AD Army. Uh, reformulate the question in your answers for those who didn't hear that. The way in which coming to the church has made me reinterpret my military experiences has made me look back on them. That's a really good question. On the one hand, you know, in the military, we were fighting for some of the vestiges of Christian civilization that remain. We were fighting to bring liberal democracy and some of the, the Christian elements that make it work in, in a good way. And also the military definitely did help me to come to Christianity for some of the reasons I was discussing. It showed me the value of servant leadership, for example. Mm. That was one of the things that really uh, inspired me once I started to learn more about Catholicism. I, I saw the importance of servant leadership in the military. And then I realized the person who invented servant leadership is Jesus. He was the one that said, no, we really have to lead in a strong way. You know, he wasn't just pandering to his followers. He was really trying to bring them to something more. But he was doing it in a way where he served them, where he wasn't just being a tyrant who looked down on them from on high. Now, at the same time, there, there were some bad influences in the military, especially from the hedonistic side and, and a lot of the counterculture revolution that make me glad that I'm, I'm not in it anymore. Mm. Yeah. I, I didn't ask this, but I'm interested. Your family and friends uh, from prior to this, did, did they go to your baptism? How, how did they take it? A lot of them did, yes. Mm, cool. Did. Yeah. So it was a, a decent event. They sort of understood. They, they viewed me as just sort of off searching through many different things, and now this was the yeah. latest thing that I found. Sure. But, That's going to be hard, hey? when people don't necessarily take your latest choice seriously because they think it might be part of a, a continuum of choices. Yes. But I, you have solid friends in the faith who know that you've arrived. Now I feel like I've really come home. Glory to Jesus Christ, man. That's beautiful.
by yeah. his grace. And and also with the military experience, I can look back now and see that there were times where God definitely intervened in my life then in a big way. Mm. We, in Afghanistan on my first tour, we took a suicide bomber who is just about 15 or 20 meters away from us when he detonated, but I, I could, I'm certain that God was with me then. And there are other things that I, I don't think I could have accomplished except for him intervening in my life at that time. Mm. As an Australian, I'm interested in what you think or what how you feel when people say to you, thank you for your service. Is that, how, how do you take that? Um, I think that service is, is something that should be done more as with humility, with service. So it, it's not good to be too brazen with it. There is some of that nowadays. <clears throat> Do you remember the advertisement of from Budweiser about that guy coming home and then his uh, fiance or something had organized an entire um, parade for him just because he came home from deployment? No. Uh, so, so it was this ad that was maybe, uh, it was about seven or eight years ago, I would say. And everyone in the military hated that guy. Hmm because it was just kind of singling out him as this grand Dio's very in your face. Thank you. That was too much. And actually he was also violating uniform standards hmm. in the advertisement, which a, a lot of people didn't realize he was missing his rank on his uniform and was wearing a jacket that you're only allowed to wear on the, the aviation flight line. Hmm. So that kind of overly grandiose stuff is bad. It's important to remind soldiers of their humility sometimes. But the gratitude on behalf of the American people is something you think that should be encouraged? Authentic gratitude is a great part of Christianity as well. And that is something that, that should be encouraged. Mm -hmm. I mean, military people do make a lot of sacrifice to commit themselves to fighting the good fight, to doing important work. Thomas Aquinas actually was very big on this. This is one of the areas where he departed from a lot of other Christian theologians in saying that some of these acts that people do by the natural law, even if they're not ordering them to God and they're not doing them with perfect charity, they still have some merit to mm -hmm. them. They have a lot of virtue to them, mm -hmm. which, which he attracted a lot of criticism for in his day. And, but like I was saying, that gratitude shouldn't be too grandiose. You know, Christ makes a lot of references to, okay, if you do these good things, like yeah. if you fast, don't then just look all uh, <laughs> low so that everyone can see that you're fasting. Don't sound your trumpets yeah, in the marketplace yeah. about it. Gotcha. Thanks. Anything else, Neil, that came through? Uh, we had a $5 super chat from Jacob. Have Thanks, you Jacob. or heard of the gurus, the young man, and elder Pasios? I think you'd be super interested in it. It's really good. Um, I haven't heard of that, but there is a lot to be said about gurus. So it, it's a good suggestion to talk about that because the, the guru student relationship is a very weird one. And I don't know the criticism that that kind of book makes, but even in the traditional way of doing yoga, the guru actually takes over your karma. So the karma is kind of the residue in your character from the, the actions that you've done, the, the effects in your soul. They, it's analogous maybe to character in a way. When you gain initiation from a guru in the tradition, he actually takes control of your karma. And then you're supposed to revere him as if he is Shiva embodied in Kashmiri Shaivism. So that led to a lot of cultish dependency issues where yogis were really turned in on themselves on their little guru clique in weird ways. Um, Christopher Wallace, one of the yoga instructors I was citing earlier, who's also a, a professor, he has criticized this in saying that it's just led to a lot of guru self-absorption. Mm. People have absorbed their entire selves into a guru that many of the gurus have been happy to go along with. So it, it's very much incompatible with the, the Western and Christian way of forming a good identity and then uniting that to God. That's one of the key distinctions <clears throat> in, between us and yoga. 
we aim to to build up a healthy sense of self, a healthy ego. Ego is a pretty neutral term. It just means I. Mm-hmm. St. Augustine mentions it in the confessions just offhand as something that's kind of a given. Like, okay, we all have a sense of self. <clears throat> Hopefully it is more attuned to what's actually going on. One of the bad things about pride is it makes us very Mm self-inflated in thinking we're way better than we are and we can do everything by ourselves. Mm -hmm. But the ego itself isn't bad. Prideful ego is good, is bad. Humble ego is good. A lot of the ways that Eastern thought has infiltrated a lot of the secular discourses through these types of terms of just saying that the ego is bad, the ego is bad. This wasn't even prominent in someone like Freud who tried to um, who tried to build up a healthy ego. He contrasted the ego with the id, and mm. the id was kind of the refuge of all the bad, our weird desires and everything like that. So he was trying to build a more integrated ego. Yeah. Uh, before we go to uh, maybe a final question, I'm not sure how many we got there. I, I, I got to say uh, thanks to our advertiser, Exodus 90. Have you heard of Exodus 90? I have. That's very good stuff. Did you ever do it? I haven't done it, but I've done some similar practices. Yeah, I think like as somebody who's been into the ascetical life and someone who's been in the military, it probably appeals to you because of its severity. Yes. So for those who aren't aware, uh, Exodus 90 is an ascetical program for men where for 90 days, you and a small band of brothers read through the book of Exodus and you live uh, a profoundly uh, intentional Christian life. You're praying for an hour a day. You're giving up hot showers. That was the worst part about it for me, I'll be honest. Um, You know, you're giving up sweets and alcohol entirely, you know, Um, and it's 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 hard, but it's really great. Um, So I would encourage people to click the link in the description below Exodus 90.com slash matt exodus 90.com slash matt click the link below so they know that we sent you they also have a great um program throughout advent so we're already into advent uh, but maybe you're like man i should be doing more with my advent well it's not too late exodus 90.com slash matt um and they have modified the sort of ascetical practices that you would do in a actual 90 day block to make it a little easier for you for example i don't think there are cold showers so go check it out they've put a lot of money into the app and I'm so proud of them for it. It used to be the case that we would say it's good for a Catholic app or good for whatever. But this is this is really good stuff. So go check them out. The other thing is that a whole host of men, like thousands of men, are going to be beginning Exodus 90, I think January 17th, so that they can end on Easter Sunday. So <clears throat> right now is the time, I think, to make that decision so that you, along with these thousands of men, can journey together towards Easter to become a better man. Exodus 90, that's exodus90.com slash Matt. Link is in the description below. Check them out and seriously consider it. I did it with a group of men, was it last year or the year before? <laughs> I've It was so traumatic that I've just basically gotten rid of it out of my <laughs> subconscious. But yeah, I would really recommend people check that out. Yeah, cool. I, I, this is going to sound like another ad and it's not meant to be, but um, you've heard of Hallo? Yes. The reason I bring it up is I interviewed the founder of Hallow and he was into Buddhism too. And he got into it because of that mindfulness app. And I'm not sure if you know what I'm talking about, but a Buddhist runs it. Could you look at that up, that app? Not calm. It's something else. But yeah, calm is another one of these ones where I started getting into that back when I had a smartphone because it was just legitimately helpful. And then you start noticing some, oh, that's a bit weird. Like the kind of language that they start using, it starts getting. They really are trying to bring you to a radical theological shift. The claims that they make are calm, radic- calm specifically. Or? It, I don't know too much about calm. Sure. But, but these types of apps. These types of apps, especially when they start talking about the badness of the ego and when they talk about how awareness is everything that you need to cultivate. That's a really radical theological claim that they're making. They present it as if they're not trying to convert you. But again, marketing. Mm, Yeah. Whereas that is a a really radical thing to say. And that does induce a major change in your thinking if you actually buy into it, maybe without you realizing what's going on, which is the definition of a conversion. 
What's the impetus to evangelize in Hinduism? And, you know, like you're saying it's this marketing that sort of veils the, the sort of desire to convert. I see why one would do that in Christianity. If you believe that Jesus Christ is God and that he's commissioned you to do that, you're called to do that, you should do that. You also want to see people flourish, you know. Um, it, it, what's the impetus to evangelize, as it were, in the Hindu or Buddhist tradition? Like we were saying earlier with Aquinas, there's always some kind of natural good that can get perverted. Yeah. It's natural that when we realize something of the truth that we want to share it with others. You know, it's kind of selfish just to hide out in your own cave if you've cultivated some deep wisdom as and a lot of secular society is tending in that direction where people just kind of hide wisdom themselves or they share it only for a lot of money mm -hmm. from other people. But the church realizes it's a great act of service to share the truth that you've developed, to develop it in a rigorous way with other people first, and then to, to teach it and evangelize it. So I think there is a little bit of that just natural impetus in it, but then it gets mixed up in a lot of these other shellfish motivations of uh -huh. looking to, um, to avoid the rigors of, of Christianity, to subvert its place in the society, mm -hmm. and then to... Um, to also gain a lot of money. It's, like I say, it's become quite an industry. Yeah, just yesterday I was uh, unfortunately yet accidentally listening to NPR. It turned on their annoying voices. And uh, and they were sort of, uh, I guess, what happened yesterday with the Roe, overturning Roe thing? Did you? I didn't follow the news. Right, so, so there's the Roe versus Wade thing is, is being threatened, right? Yes. In, in some capacity. And the bullshit that these NPR hosts were spewing was remarkably uh, just deceptive. Just the way they talk about child sacrifice yes. and the rights that women have to sacrifice their children, to pay hitmen to kill their children. The absolute layer and layer upon crap that they have to indoctrinate you with to make child sacrifice seem palatable. And, and the way they have to demonize those who would say, you probably shouldn't kill innocent humans. It is remarkable. And, and all this, I think, you know, like if you've bought into that lie, that demonic lie, um, and yet you've been made for more than the merely material, you can see why things like Buddhism and Hinduism become attractive. And I'm not there by, you know, uh, speaking negatively of every practitioner of these religions. They sure. may have the same horror that I do and outrage I do for, for abortion. No, that was one of the, the spiritual dynamics I, I came to realize, especially looking into a lot of the neo-pagan religions, was anytime you gain something spiritually, there's a sacrifice that needs to be made. You know, you, leave, you need to leave behind a little bit of your selfishness, a lot, some of your um, smallness to, to gain new things, to possess new things. And... In, in Christianity, that's first a gift from God, and it's made possible by Christ's sacrifice, first and foremost, even though we suffer a lot. Now, that does bring out a lot of suffering when you lose those things. When, when that's something that you're just doing for your own power, a lot of times they demand sacrifice from other people in order to raise themselves up. So I came to think of abortion as basically like a child sacrifice on the altar of personal convenience. Amen. That's what it is. Yeah, that's what it is. It's disgusting and despicable, and it's worse than you think that it is because you don't know the dignity of every human being. You don't even know the dignity of one human being and that Christ Jesus, the second person of the Trinity, shed his blood for that soul, and we sacrifice them at the altar of supposed sexual liberation. Like, it's it's absolutely repugnant. Anyway, sorry, just thought I'd... Oh, no need to apologize. Mm. That's... So what's what's the future look like for you? You're living in D.C. with your beautiful fiance. Yes, uh, we're going to move to Denver. Okay, and I am applying now to get a master's degree at the Augusta Institute. Sweet man, awesome. We're also interested in the community of the Beatitudes. Yes, good. My next door neighbors are part of that community. Would you believe that? From England. Oh, okay. Is this where it founded? It was founded in England. It was founded in France. Yeah, France is what I meant. Sorry, that's what I meant. Jacques Philippe. Father Jacques Philippe. I got to introduce you to these these people who live a couple doors down. If you'd be into that, yeah, they would love to meet you. Sounds good. They're beautiful souls. I mean, this, he teaches theology. He's a doctor. He teaches theology at the university, 
And it's so beautiful when you see Christians who love Jesus. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like he teaches theology and every day him and his wife go take a holy hour. They got like four, five kids, take a holy hour and then get coffee together. They're just, they're, just, they're so in love with our Lord. Well, the, the community of the Beatitudes really tries to bring more cultural integration, to bring lay into a real authentic yeah. spiritual life. And also they do a lot with the Eastern rites and they do it with a very <clears throat> Carmelite inspiration. And is this prominent in Denver? They have their main house in the U.S. in Denver. Okay. Their only house in the U.S. My fiance spent nine months with them, three months in Israel and six months in France yeah. in a monastery. Glory to God, man. We're excited about that. And then I'm discerning what I want to do with that. I want to do some kind of church service. Mm. I'm interested in maybe church administration, but I'm also interested in apologetics and yeah. writing on some of the things that we're discussing yeah. now. Well, you really do have you know, firsthand experience of this in a way that a lot of people in the church wouldn't. So that would be such a gift for us. I hope I can warn others about it. And I certainly wouldn't recommend this path yeah. that I've been on to others, but there are a lot of good things uh, to learn about it. Some, some positive things, like I was saying about doing Lectio Divina based on more bodily things to, to live more embodied and to recognize the dignity of the body in a way that's rigorous. <clears throat> still maintains Christian chastity and does it for Christian purposes. Yeah. That doesn't just evolve into a way of sort of idolizing the body and empowering yourself. Are, are you findable online somewhere? If people wanted to maybe get in touch with you or see some of the stuff you've written, is there somewhere you'd point them? Um, I don't have much that's written online. A few articles in Small Wars Journal and yeah. uh, one about the abuse crisis, uh, okay. talking about how Along with uh, some of these sexual issues I learned about in uh, yoga and Buddhism, I mean, I realized there was also tons of problems with child abuse. One of the, the Hare Krishna cardinal equivalents, he was the top of the religion in the U.S., actually uh, was convicted of sexually abusing minors. And then he was indicted for hiring a hitman to try and silence the people who were accusing him of this. Mm -hmm. And then there was tons of other problems with in other areas as well. So I wrote an article about that. Um, I'd, I'd certainly be glad, happy to share my email. With Would people. you? Yeah. All right. Are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> I'll, I'll give it to you. And, uh, well, because if you give it, some it other way. you can share it. I can put it in the description below. But just so you know, when Jacob Imam was on my show, he said he got 400 emails over the course of a few weeks. <laughs> so if you want to do it, we can do it, man. But I have exams in the next upcoming week, <laughs> but maybe later I should have time All right. to answer that. Well, well, we could discuss that yeah, later. Yeah, and if you agree, we'll put it in the description below. Yeah. Uh, I'm certainly interested in connecting with more people who are interested in these kinds of things and talking about how to uh, bring good good Christian practices, but, and, but also educate people on the dangers of this. Now, where would, since, you know, the Lord hasn't, it doesn't seem he's called you, at least at this point, to begin a sort of apostolate and educating people about this. If someone was out there like, okay, where can I learn more about the problems with yoga? Is there a place you'd point them to online? There's one secular discounts Carmelite who has written a few articles on this and she didn't practice it, but she has some pretty well-written things mm, okay. that talk about it. Um, Do you know her name? If we think of it. She, we'll, she's we'll on the website, up. Women of Grace. She's written a few articles about that. Okay. So, so that's one good area to look if, and she recommends Brother Lawrence from the Carmelite tradition. Mm as a good antidote to that. He had a good sense I of I didn't just, realize he was a Carmelite. Yeah. Practice the presence of God, right? Practice the presence of God. Yeah. Um, I think of him as sort of a masculine version of St. Therese of the Sioux. Yeah. He was very Little simple. Way. Yeah. yeah. Uh, in your journeys, have you become familiar at all with um, Father um, Richard Raw? A little bit. <laughs> Would you be interested to know that I went on his male initiation rite of passage in New Mexico? I am interested to know about it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know enough to be interested. I don't want to tell you something you, you don't really care about. <laughs> it's just that it was I've such a, a unique experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gosh, yeah. He's one of these guys who's like such a gifted, gifted presenter, and he speaks with I think a real authority. Um, and he also says many things that are just incredibly helpful and 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 um, 
but it's also intermingled with a sort of, uh, what do you say, edgeless <laughs> uh, mysticism, Christianity that blends into other things. It's, it sort of seems like, I'm not sure if the critiques against um, the Trappist monk, uh, Thomas, Thomas, Merton. Thomas Merton, I'm not sure how, um, you know, much stock I should put in those objections because I haven't really looked into it, you know. But he seems to sort of be running in that direction, and it and it was it was a problematic conference for many reasons. Yeah, I've seen some of his talks where he talks about the dualism of the Christian tradition, right? And those are very problematic. I mean, yoga goes in one of and mindfulness as well, and Buddhism go in one of two directions: extreme dualism or extreme non-dualism. Mm. Dualism is where there's only formless, eternal stillness, awareness, and everything else is a mere illusion. And then non-dualness is where they say, all right, this stuff is actually real, but it, its true nature is illusionary and that its true nature is actually consciousness. Yeah, Everything is consciousness. And people like St. John of the Cross and Thomas Aquinas have dealt with this with incredible precision. You know, John of the Cross says that even though the soul appears to be God because so much of God's light is shining through it, but it remains ontologically different. In its actual being, it remains substantially yeah. different. Yeah, It's like having a window where the sunlight is shining through it and the glass is so pure hmm. that... You can mistake the window for the light source. Exactly. It just appears to be pure light, but the window is still different than the light. Right. Yeah, cool. Oh, we, have, we have a super chat who's oh. asking about... Um, Related, but I could be wrong about like crystals, rock crystals. Thoughts on uh, that's related. Thoughts on rock crystals. <laughs> uh, this is where some of the yoga stuff gets mixed in with the neo pagan things. I mean, they, yeah. there's a lot of different interpretations of the extent to which they bring in a lot of the old traditional Hindu pagan beliefs in some of the. Um, some of the modern traditions like Kashmiri Shaivism are monotheistic, so they don't give much credence to things like this, but then there is a lot of this traditional animistic magical things where they attribute some spiritual being to things like rocks or planets, hmm. which is astrology. I mean, astrology, astrology, by the way, is very common in secular society, I and mean, they're claiming their stuff is not anti-science, but then they have a horoscope column the basis of which is that the planets have some spiritual quality to them yeah. and their position relative to us then affects our soul spiritually yeah. in some way. That's pretty anti-science. And, and uh, I mean, when you look at something like a rock or a crystal, it can change your soul just from your appreciation of beauty of it. There's yeah. a really good understanding of beauty in the Catholic tradition about how it can bring your soul into a good state. And mm -hmm. being in cathedrals was one of yeah. the things that helped influence my conversion. Wow. Because it was such a still, pure feel to it. You know, I was meditating and uh, becoming sensitive to these things, but at the same time, it wasn't one that was just kind of hanging out there. It was also trying to lift me up towards something more I could feel. I didn't mm -hmm. understand what that was at, at the time. But now I know what it is, uh, the beatific vision and union with God and the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> uh, so it, it's certainly, rocks can affect your feelings in a certain way, yeah. but the, I mean, to attribute magical powers to them and things like I'm that. I'm also I mean. seeing this sort of idea in doTERRA and other essential oil people. I'm not saying doTERRA specifically, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying about the oils? People have all these like random things. Yeah. That they're saying. I've, I've encountered Christians who are like, no, this helps with depression and this helps with cancer. I'm like, okay, but like, does it though? Because So there, there's some validity to some naturopathy and those might have some effects, uh, it's sure. just natural healing techniques. Yeah. Uh, St. Hildegard of Bingen was a naturopath oh, herself. Wow. People are still making her uh, yeah. her cookie recipes <laughs> thousands, a thousand years almost after she died. And There's no marijuana in those cookies, is it? <laughs> no. <laughs> <clears throat> she would have been anti-drug, certainly. Cool. Yeah, yeah. Talk about a power woman. She was uh, a composer, a natural historian, the precursor to biology. Wow. 
a, a mystic, a theologian, and a naturopath. So, and people are still reading her writings and things like that almost a thousand years later, whereas in Kashmiri Shaivism, there was one lineage founded by a woman, one main lineage, but it's extinct and we don't have any of her writings anymore. So they didn't maintain any of it. Mm. But uh, naturopathy can have some validity to it, but a lot of that stuff can devolve into superstition. Yeah, well, superstition. it's interesting. I mean, I, I mean, if you want to categorize it this way, I know some people don't like the term supernatural, but I mean, if you wanted to categorize it that way, you've got like the natural way things are, and then there's a supernatural way. Like those are the only options. And yeah. so if if lavender oil is going to <laughs> cure me of depression, there's either a scientific sort of basis for this, like a, a, a basis in the material world, or it's supernatural. And that's the problem when people start going into these things like reflexology and other things like this, where people are talking about the spiritual world. It's not Christianity they're talking about. No. And there's like, there's good and bad. There's no like medium. So it's either demons or angels. And so this, uh, this all gets back to the division between the spiritual and the worldly. In non-dual yoga and Buddhism, they fuse those two together. So it can lead to a lot of these things of overly attributing spiritual causes to things that are just natural mm -hmm. and getting lost in spiritual things. Whereas um, then there's too much dualism where you think that spiritual things are completely divorced from the world. Yeah. We, as Thomas Aquinas say, we ride the mean yes. between those in Christianity. Yeah. So there's still very important differences between the spiritual and the worldly. And things that make sense in the spiritual world, like having a lot of suffering, might not make sense in worldly logic. That's yeah. a common hang-up that people have. But <clears throat> they are integrated with one another at the same time. And ultimately, we our whole purpose in life is to unite ourselves with the divine. Mm. Amen. Alex, thank you so much for taking the effort to, to come down here and be on the show. Thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Cool.